started the recording so i request the attention of all the respected faculties and delegates kindly allow me a few minutes of yours and let me introduce myself and with the faculty members of this session good evening and welcome to one and all i am ritparna the assigned moderator from twernet today we are uh, i am a designated scientist assistant for a seamless experience and clarinet is india's most trusted and widely used to take that home with multiple enriching services exclusively for the doctors clarinet is very proud to be digital partner for the very first episode on mps national clinical trial online summit day one organized by medical pharmacology society of india now without wasting any further minute let's begin to this session for which i would like to invite dr chinmay mahapatra the honorable president of global pharmacovigilance society to coordinate further over to you sir thank you so much ma'am respected dignitaries in the panel a very warm good afternoon to all of you respected uh, dr basavana sir and dr uh, prativar big ma'am and uh, respected uh, dr ashok sir who is the dean and principal of uh, cds imr and uh, the uh, main sponsor of our event today mr uh, snehendu konner and uh, dr manish singh yadav who is the ceo at ethnic crs who is also a who trainer and be trials and inspection so a warm welcome to all of you and uh, the participants who have joined uh today from all across the globe maybe some 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 may be from outside of india or uh, inside of india whatever it may be so um it is a good response where we uh, come to a single platform to learn something from the uh, experts clinical research experts uh, so let's uh, uh, let's uh, let me Uh, introduce i uh, means let me invite all of you to join this event with a um saraswati vandana with uh, no sir not no. just a minute sir just a minute i'll take just 5 minutes time uh, so actually uh, this is a event it is uh, organized by medical pharmacology society which is founded in the year 2016 so um dr uh, sivamurthy sir who is the uh, founder president of this society he took the all the efforts to make it happen and uh, uh, this august gathering is only because of him uh, today and uh, the event is uh, named beautifully like national clinical trial summit and it has got um, forward notes from dcgi the control yeah. general of india okay so many Uh, many experts and many doctors many physicians many pharmacists so they have joined this uh, program today and uh, this program will run for two days it will be in online mode today. so it will be for four hours 4 to 8 pm in both the days august 5 and 6 so let's uh, uh, start this uh, august means beautiful program by saraswati vandana so for that i would like to uh, invite uh, dr uh, renuka nyogi to um, to um, sorry to interrupt you uh, yeah. dear faculties so before starting the saraswati vandana kindly allow me to mute every participants and i would request the speaker the respective speaker to mute himself or herself before starting the session right because it is creating noise in the background <laughs> Yeah. So, uh, I would request Renu Kamam to unmute yourself and continue further. Okay. So, uh, Dr. Shiva Murthy, if you can confirm, am I audible? You can just show me a thumbs up. Am I audible? Yes, okay. ma'am. You are audible. Okay. Okay. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, we'll begin with the Saraswati Vandana. <clears throat> शारदे 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 उदयोस्तु ते तु 
ज सर्वदे करी वंदना तुज सर्वदे देवते आशीर्वते देवते आशीर्वते मम पूर्ण हो मन कामना शारदे 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 रूपिणी ओम चेत कला सकला कला वरदायिनी रूपिणी ओम चेत कला सकला कला वरदायिनी भारती आधार तू भारती आधार तू सारस्वता प्रिय दर्शनी ज्ञान विद्या स्वयं वेदांत तू अमला गुणा शारदे 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 थैंक यू Dr. Chinmay, you are on mute. You need to unmute. Thank you so much, ma'am, for the lovely song, and uh, uh, the audience. So you will be there with us till the last. Okay. So as a speaker, she is going to deliver her talk at the last of the session today. So, uh, but she has some work, so she will leave and she will join again. Okay. So moving forward, uh, I would like to. Uh, introduce Dr. Uh, just let me share my screen. <laughs> so, Dr. Basavana uh, sir, he, he, has, he has done his MD pharmacology. From CE, CCED, and uh, he is the professor. Currently, he is working as a professor in the HOD Department of Clinical Pharmacology, Mysore Medical College and Research Institute of Mysore. And he is also the coordinator of Pharmacovigilance Center at MMC and RI, and uh, State Nodal Officer for Metro Vigilance Program of India, and the Nodal Officer for uh, Ayushman Digital Mission NM NMC, and uh, the Nodal Officer for Digital Mission Mode Project One and Two. Uh, MCI New Delhi and uh, Vice President of People Association of Genetic and Prominent Mysore. With this, sir, I would like to uh, invite you to speak few words about this uh, event. Over to you, sir. Hello. Am audible? Yes, sir. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Our MPS, that is Medical Pharmacal Society, is established with the main motto to organize a good academic program for the benefit of uh, MD pharmacologists and also for the enhancing uh, skills of uh, professionals as well as academicians working in various health sectors and uh, clinical research institutes and, and industries as well as other uh, institutes. The MPS uh, National uh, uh, clinical trial summit 2023 that is is uh, one of such a, a big event which is uh, happening today as well as tomorrow for this uh, uh, grand event i cordially welcome dr shivamuthi our uh, mps president and also i welcome the major sponsor of uh, of this event uh, clinimed life sciences uh, mr uh, snehendu koner Co-sponsor, uh, Ethics in C CRS, uh, Dr. Manish Singh Yadav. I welcome uh, Diana Cyber Medical College Principal, Dr. Ashok Sir, and uh, Dr. Fatiba Nadik, Madam, HOD Pharmacology, and uh, JP ADR, uh, Dr. Chinmaya, and uh, Dr. Rajiv Raghuvamshi Sir, that is our GC, uh, DCGI Government of India, 
and our i will also welcome dr somnath babu he is ex deputy the controller and i will also most important i welcome all 20 speakers and 35 authors as well as moderators and other all most important for successful at this event that are most importantly that is almost nearly about 400 plus participants i welcome heartily all um, participants and organizing committee members the cro's smos pharma academicians students pharmacists and pharma industry leaders please join join us to uh, this uh, event to make a, a grand success welcome you all once again thank you thank you thank you uh, jai hind thank you so much sir now i would like to invite uh, our uh, esteemed one more guest you can say he is the host of our uh, event also so dr uh, is none other than dr shivamurthy sir just a minute i will share my screen just a minute hold on yes currently he is working as associate professor and i uh, sorry he is currently working and now he is today only he has got promoted to professor so sorry sir <laughs> it is a mistake by my side and uh, department of pharmacology he is working as a professor now at the department of pharmacology cds iimer bangalore he is the main founder president of uh, medical pharmacology society and uh, it has been established in uh, 2000 currently he is associated with uh, cds imr he has 22 plus years of post md experience and uh, 13 years in industry and 9 years in medical colleges having additional responsibility like pharmacovigilance coordinator adr monitoring center uh, cds imer center and uh, managing editor of jp adr journal animal ethic committee or safety committee members and sls company etc and the awards he has received so many awards like uh, first rank in md pharmacology 2001 rguhs then awarded first prize and second prize for pharmacovigilance related short movies during npw national pharmacovigilance week event or events organized by nccp vpi or uh, then government of india then he he has got awarded with a second prize for oral scientific paper presentation at hyper asia conference held at sbmc chennai his project received research society certificate 2003 at st john's medical college and third prize for the oral presentation at src ips ips conference he is awarded with of insc research excellence award 2023 for his publication on topic nsids and its sars for building safer products editorial team members of ebook and pharmaco business reflective e writing ebook uh, so uh, and he has got around uh, publications in peer reviewed journals and 15 presentations in national conference with two indian patents to his credit and speakers in various national and international conferences and organization organizers of various workshops seminar and conferences uh, webinar more than 35 conferences or he has organized so with this uh, uh, words uh, i would like to invite uh, uh, the founder president of medical pharmacology society to say a few words regarding this event today welcome sir hello am i audible yes. everyone Yes, okay sir. first of all i would like to you know join my hands to everyone who has joined today and more than 430 people wanted to you know attend this program and i am very much humbled first of all to say that you know like i never expected i was telling my friend my colleague uh, dr ravi mala uh, that you know i am expecting only 100 participation to make it successful but you know uh, and i was telling him also that you know i may receive around 300 but my expectation is only 100 but now i have got 400 plus registrations which is really a great blessings for the you know medical pharmacology society and all the speakers i would say and as all of you know that medical pharmacology society is established with the objective to you know serve everyone in this you know uh, in this community of clinical research drug development pharmacology biotechnology drug development everywhere so our objective is to 
our objective is to cater to everyone and and uh, even though life members can be only md pharmacologists but we are open for collaborations like you know conducting programs trainings or any research activities anything and uh, with this you know like i would like to thank everyone and uh, we have uh, like including speakers moderators and then authors of our book today we are going to release ebook on clinical trial management which is written by 35 participants and uh, really it is a great effort since last one and a half month and we have come up with a you know knowledge feast i request everyone to enjoy cooperate help us to make it a best experience with this kind words i would like to thank everyone thank you thank you so much sir um now i would uh, like to invite uh, dr M mr snehendu konnet uh, who is the, from clinimed life science privately to um, to read out the that we have received from dcgi as a form of uh, forward are you there sir yeah i'm just opening okay okay Uh, so can i do the uh, you know sharing of the uh, uh, this my uh, window yes sir you can uh, share your screen sir ah. yes now uh, just one minute Hello. So can I share? Yes, yes, sir. I'm just sharing the window so that you will be able to see the message. Uh, all of you are able to see the DCGI message. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. It is visible. Yes. Yeah. Uh, good afternoon, all. All the participants and speakers, and eminent speakers, and uh, the so used to it. So, uh, am I audible? Hello. Yes, sir. You are yeah. audible. Fine. So uh, we approach as uh, thanks uh, MPS and everybody for conducting this, and from all the sponsors, thanks to all the sponsors, and of course the Clarnet who was uh, who gave the virtual support in this program, and <laughs> it is nice program, and it has saved up. just because of the mps and uh, you know that the contribution from all end and just we approached uh, cgi sir dr uh, rajiv singh raghubongsi but uh, due to some urgent program he couldn't attend this but uh, he gave me some messages that you can just read out these things but though uh, it is not approved for the yet for the for our e book seed handbook but once it will be approved of course it will be published in our ebook on clinical trial management though it is being published as a soft copy but uh, i think dr siva that uh, once it will be you have already got the permission from uh, the publishers and the publishing authority and then once it will be published and before this we get the approval try to get the approval and then you can put it on this in the uh, second or third page as a forward okay so the message i can read uh, here the dear readers greetings from the office of cbsco i am delighted to see that the medical pharmacology society has taken the initiative to conduct the mps national clinical trial summit 2023 online conference i am also happy to have come across the book title e book on clinical trial management written by speakers organizers of the conference all the learned organizers speakers and authors have made their best efforts to highlight some of the regulations and guidelines laid down in the country towards the quality conduct of clinical trials in india i am also happy to see more than 300 registrations though uh, this message was uh, once this message was given to us then it was 300 now it is i think uh, around 4 or more than 400 Anyway, the 300 registrations to 
attend the MPS NCTS 2023 conference. I encourage MPS and its office bearers and members to conduct more such programs and keep the educational and literary activities going to enrich the country with all trained ethics committee members, clinical trial team members, and clinical research and development industry professionals. It gives me immense pleasure to see the great efforts made by the office bearers of MPS and organizers of this conference to bring highly experienced faculty to speak on the most important topics like good clinical practice, ICMR ethics guidelines, NDCT 2019 notes, etc. Activities like these will go a long way towards developing the nation's capability to conduct quality clinical research. I also encourage the organizers to conduct more such programs and come up with the updated versions of ebook on clinical trial management as and when the new regulations are implemented. I believe that academicians, NGOs, industry professionals, regulators, and bureaucrats of the government of India should work as a team to implement quality practices in clinical research and drug development activities. Initiatives like this will go a long way towards making this happen with best wishes. Rajiv Singh Raghubamsi, Drug Controller General of India, Drug Licensing Authority, Secretary Come Scientific Director in Indian Pharmacopoeia Commissions, Ministry of Health and Family Welfare, Government of India. Thanks. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, Shivamurthy, sir? Yes, yes, yeah, yeah. So thank you very much, sir. Uh, it's uh, really nice, and we are re really thankful to uh, DCGI uh, for uh, you know uh, uh, giving such uh, interest. I mean, uh, uh, very important words to the nation and to the world of clinical research and drug development. And uh, so we look forward for you know your live presence in the future. And hope that you know we would like we will be having in our future events uh, as a you know a participant and also uh, as a, a chief guest and uh, as a you know um, as a keynote speaker and all. So looking forward for your your support in the future and we are definitely here as an MPS to organize more programs like this and. Uh, and we are happy that you know finally all the speakers' notes are like you know all the uh, articles are made into a book and which will be coming soon. And uh, Dr. Basu sir uh, will be there by 5:30, and uh, we will be releasing that. Okay, now we are uh, we can go further uh, for the uh, Chinmay. You can take over, uh, sir. So I'm uh, sharing my slides, sir. Uh, just... Yes. Okay. So can you please? Uh, uh, share uh, you are about you so that I would like to introduce you. Yes. Yeah. So now we have the uh, you know next speaker, uh, Dr. Chinmaya Mahapatra. He will be talking about. Can you make it a uh, full window? Yes, sir. I'm putting it. Yes. 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 So next speaker, our next speaker is Dr. Chinmaya Mahapatra. He is a uh, M Farm M uh, PhD. And uh, you know, like uh, I would like to say that he's been with me uh, continuously supporting this event, and definitely for you and Dr. Sanjeev Gupta, who is also the moderator tomorrow. And I would like to thank both of you. Both of you are really great, and thank you very much for you know uh, handholding uh, and supporting all of us. And uh, with this, I would like to say that you know Dr. Chinmay Mahapatra, he is going to speak on evolution of GCP uh, and uh, he's uh, like to tell about uh, Dr. Chinmay, he's a gold medal awardee in master's degree, uh, completed his PhD from Baram Apur uh, University with a DST inspired fellowship. He had co yeah. accompanied his post graduation diploma in clinical research from Bangalore. He has over 10 plus years of experience in the field of pharmaceuticals and pharmacovigilance. He has worked as a quality assurance officer for Siron uh, Drugs and IPCA Laboratories. Currently, he's working as the uh, LQPPV uh, uh, for into uh, uh, into vigilance, and along with his uh, with this, he is also associated with Neotia University. Uh, Neotia University as a full-time associate uh, professor and HOD 
uh, of the development of pharmaceuticals. He has published a book called uh, Fundamental Concepts of Pharmacy and Its Application with nine research articles and four Indian patents to his credit, two German uh, patents to his credit, and three UK design patents to his credit. He is a certified member of Association of Clinical Research Professionals and uh, uh, USA, ACRP USA. Since 2020, he is leading the International Peer Reviewed Journal, Journal of uh, Pharmacovigilance and Drug Research, JPADR, as a chief editor in chief and is also a founder president of global pharmacovigilance society chinmay i would like to say that you know if you are uh, uh, within 10 years you are able to achieve so much and uh, i would like to see you growing uh, further and looking forward for uh, you know more associations with you thank you yes, sir thank you so much sir i will uh, open my slide just a minute So good afternoon once again. Uh, myself, Dr. Chinmay Mahapatra, editor in chief, the Journal of Pharmacovigilance and Drug. I would like to uh, thanks the organizers, Dr. Uh, Shivamurti Sar and uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Shiva Sankar and Mr. Ravi Teja, who are the supporting staff of uh, who helped in organizing this event and. Uh, the all the dignitaries in the panel and the, the delegates who have joined today for this uh, event I, I will not take much time to complete my talk because we have a panel of speakers uh, around seven or eight speakers for today so just uh, i will briefly i will say about the history or origin of uh, gcp can you okay. please make it to a full screen yes sir so, um, see, we'll just discuss one thing, just small story. Like, uh, suppose I am a, a mad scientist, okay? I'm not a good scientist, I'm a mad scientist. I uh, prepared one uh, drug formulation, and uh, I don't know whether uh, it will work in the human or not. I'm not it. So for that, I did all the animal study. I got all the data, but still uh, the first step, like uh, in, in in the uh, means administering that formula to a human being that is a big channel for any scientist in the world so this is what the clinical work came out from that okay clinical trial means we have to test our newly investigated drug in a subject or in a human body or human being okay that suppose if i uh, i will not say anything to that uh, patient and i will just simply administer that drug so is that ethical uh, means we think we don't think that it is ethical right mm -hmm. similarly if we think of uh, um, the safety profile of the drug okay so we cannot cheat someone by not disclosing reality of the drug and we have to respect someone uh, uh, we cannot take a vulnerable subject okay and uh, we cannot uh, harm to someone uh, our... dr chinmay dr chinmay can you be a little bit louder, louder. yes sir. yeah yeah so we we cannot harm someone our benefit because when i um, suppose i have in means I have uh, got a formulation and a pharmaceutical company approached me and he said that uh, you can uh, made a false claim that this work on this uh, uh, work for this disease and uh, yes think that yes I will get so much money if I will do that then so, ultra see the things okay whatever you can say uh, then it won't be good right because we will directly play with the uh, health of the hum um, volunteers, health of the uh, right. 
so these three things like we have not we are not supposed to cheat someone we have to respect everyone and we we should not do any harm to for our benefit okay should not harm any anyone for our benefit with these three point of view the gcp the good clinical practice came out okay it is not a one one year work it took around from 190 1906 to till now still we are implementing new 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 things in the guidelines okay so in 1906 what uh, came out like uh, they have uh, in usa they have uh, the need was that that uh, required that accurate labeling of food and drugs that is the first need was there that's why in 06 they have created pure food and drug act okay but when they did that few people what they did they um, false claimed means they claimed that uh, many many false claim came out so to stop that again in 1912 like after 5 years they have uh, implemented another amendment that is called as serly amendment which is uh, which is used for uh, prohibiting the labeling medicines with false claim then after 15 years okay um, uh, the bureau of chemistry they formed a regulatory body and they uh, formed the food and drug insecticide administration okay they are unable to prevent the drug from appearing in the market okay they in 1930 they shortened the um, administration's name as food drug administration but they are unable to prevent the uh, drug that is coming into the market and which is not safe to the human being that tuskegee uh, trial started in 1932 the tuskegee trial started so all of we know that right uh, like uh, it is a for sickle cell anemia uh, they um, they did not took any informed consent from the patient and they started uh drug to that patient and uh, actually what happened like uh, they they want to study the uh, progress of the disease that's why they did not uh, treat the patient also sometime so what happened uh, down the line what happened out of 390 patient okay out of 400 patient only 74 remained alive at the end of 1972 okay. but rest of all Like twenty-eight died due to sickle cell and uh, syphilis, a uh, hundred died due to related complications, and forty of wife uh, uh, infected, and nineteen uh, children got uh, uh, congenital. Like so, that is the thing. Means the drug we can use, but it should not harm the whole population, right? And similarly, sulfonamide elixir, where one hundred seven people got. killed by uh, the um, excipient that they use right the poisonous antifreeze solvent that is called as diethylene glycol they used in the uh, formulation and they administered it orally in form of a tablet and pot. so that uh, that the, these in incidents uh, provoked the regulators to something and then the in 1938 the us fda came into act and uh, they implemented requirement of testing of drug safety so before filing any uh, nda nda is required to market a new drug new drug right so before filing nda we have to provide the safety profile of the drug to the regulator that is the need of our at that time requirement okay similarly all the other incidents were going on side by side like uh, Nuremberg trial, then thalidomide tragedy, phenylalanine, they tinted with, uh, tinted with phenobarbital. All these events gradually helped us to understand how we conduct a clinical trial. Okay, so Nuremberg court it gives sets of ethic, ethical research principles for human experimentation created by US. Okay, then after that. few days later in 1962 uh, cafever harris drug amendment came out which implemented that you have to do your um, to approve 
uh, a drug you have to give some proof of efficacy study or data or uh, or uh, you have to give some evidence that yes it, this drug is safe for human being that is requ that, that requirement in implemented okay then in 1964 what happened declaration of helsinki the basic principle stressed upon justice respect for per person and beneficence okay and uh, in uk medicines act 1968 it came out and it provided a system for licensing of manufacturing and dealing in medicines so the gmt good manufacturing practice it came in the year 1941 okay because sulfur thiazole was adulterated with phenobarbital for which what happened for that what happened 300 people got killed or injured okay it is a uh, by Wintrop's uh, sulfur thiazole tablet okay so that is what thing means the incident is occurring and we are learning from that and we are implementing our new concept to make our guidelines stronger or make our regulations stronger okay like that in uh, 1971 the concept of irb institutional review board uh, inst institutional re review board na? no irb means uh, your uh, yeah this is an ethic committee ethic committee independent review board it came out okay then in 1972 okay us fda investigators inspection start means at that time before 1972 no one was in investigating the uh, there was no investigation okay there is no inspection of the clinical trials but later on in after 1972 got started in 1974 the national research act came into play and they have creating the national commission for the protection of human subjects for biomedical and behavioral research okay in 1977 usfda first came out code of federal regulations after uh, the two years after the belmont report came out and where it has been said that you have to take informed consent before doing the clinical then in 1980 the concept of gcp born still it is in the draft mode not yet been implemented right uh, so 1981 us fda regulation and informed consent and irb they have implemented in 21 cfr 50 and 21 cfr 56 so during that time also one incident with uh, johnson and johnson's product that uh, tynanol uh, was uh, uh, administered okay so that is an incident where few people got died uh, there. Uh, then they uh, implemented one more thing, anti-tempering act. It means uh, it is related to uh, tempering of the drug products. It means we cannot uh, follow death due to uh, the, this one. Okay. Then in 1986, the national GCP guideline came out, and 1987 drug antibiotic and biologic drug product regulations came. Out. In 88, guidelines for monitoring clinical okay so like that means gradually one by one new they are implementing for ourselves okay means how we can do the trial and how we can get quality data that is the two important thing so sim simultaneously in 1991 european gcp for clinical trial and european countries and the japan gcp manual both have been uh, started uh, working right and um, in 1922 clinical laboratory act came out means why it is required like uh, whatever tests we are doing in human being that should be get approved from some agency right and that should be from some good lab regulated uh, the lab should be regulated where we are doing the test so that's why it came out then in 1994 who guideline for gc for uh, drug trials came out then in 1995 it is who gcp drafted okay in 1996 the ics uh, issues issued the tripartite guideline for gcp okay 1996 so gradually 1997 implementation of ics gcp guidelines then in 20 uh, 2000 the declaration of helsinki got revised it is it has got revised four five times okay in 2020 uh, 2000 is the last one then uh, in 2001, the EU, European Clinical Trial Directive came out. Then in 2016, ICGCP E6 came out. Okay, in 2013, 
23 means currently it is in ICH GCP E6 R3 draft. Okay, it is not means it is in review mode. So again, another few new um, guidelines will come come out. Okay, uh, so that the uh, just brief uh, briefly I I have uh, discussed about the uh, history of the um, clinical research. So now uh, I would like to uh, hand over the mic to Dr. Uh, to uh, share the uh, what are the principle of principles of clinical trial. Over to you, sir. Yes, I will take over. Can you end your presentation? Yes, no, I will. Just one minute, just one. Can you can you see the full window? Yes, sir. Okay. Yeah. Now you can see the full window. Yes. Okay. Can I start the presentation? Yes, sir. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. I will briefly talk about principles of clinical good clinical practice i would like to tell you that i have almost executed nearly 600 biology bioequivalence trials in addition to it i supported another 15 20 uh, clinical trials as a medical monitor so with this experience i would like to tell you that you know like ich gcp uh, so there are you know ich means it is international council of Hormonization good clinical practice okay so in this ich if you go to the website of ich.org there you will see there are varieties of guidelines that are released and they are divided into efficacy quality safety and multidisciplinary guidelines in that we are what we are talking today is good clinical practice which is e6 okay so it is coming under the efficacy guideline okay so like this there are so many are there so i'm not going to detail about this please go to the ich.org uh, website there you will find all the different kinds of guidelines now we will restrict ourselves to the ich e6 principles of good clinical practice okay so here uh, let me tell you about the uh, definition it is a standard for the design conduct performance monitoring auditing recording analysis and reporting of clinical trials that provides assurance that the data or and the reports results okay reported results are credible accurate and that the rights integrity and confidentiality of trial subjects are protected so you can see that a whole lot of things are included in this definition okay so right from the design of the clinical trial and the performance and conduct of the clinical trial and how to monitor what to monitor when to monitor everything is defined here auditing means you know checking the quality checking the assurance of the you know quality or ensuring that the it is really done okay whether the work is really done or it is falsified like that auditing recording so what is the method what kind of forms you are going to use analysis okay you have have these structured analytical methods which is already defined uh, whether it is a blood plasma or it is the data analysis and reporting of it and re reporting of all the data that is collected during the clinical trials that provides assurance why we should do all these monitoring exercises because whatever we do it should give some kind of assurance to the public okay assurance to the public not only in india it is throughout the globe Okay, because ICH is an international guideline. If you follow this ICH guideline, you will be assuring that the data collected is applicable throughout the world. So that's why this is very important. Okay, and the data collected and reported and the results are credible, accurate, and at the same time, while doing all these rights, integrity, and confidentiality. See, the subjects, the most important person here is who is helping you to conduct the uh, research that is subjects. Okay, the subjects rights, integrity. Okay, so they are not disfamer, uh, they are defamed. Okay, so their rights and integrity and their family values and their personal values are maintained and confidentiality of the clinical trial subjects are 
protected okay so that is the things so now i'll try to get into the each and every there are 13 principles which are already highlighted in ICH gcp i'll try to get into each one of them see here you can see that there are three different words what you are seeing okay now here so as per the first principle the clinical research or clinical trial should be conducted as per the ethical principles that are defined in declaration of helsinki okay declaration of helsinki why this has come in see after the teradomite disaster so world medical association they came together and they defined set of rules and set of guidelines set of sentences which talks about what is important what is the kind of you know guidelines that someone need to file uh, follow and what is ethics what is subject like that you know they defined and they kept on revising once in four over four years so recently i think i believe that 2017 was the last uh, uh, you know revision maybe i believe that it may be uh, any other revision has happened also i'll have to check but otherwise i can say that declaration of helsinki is very important and you every protocol that is you know executed that should have an attachment as the declaration of helsinki in their protocol okay and sign in your declaration saying that declaration of helsinki like you no know, investigator declaration saying that declaration of helsinki is considered and that will be applied so this sentence is very much important similarly gcp as you know already how the gcp award and also that gcp ich gcp again you need to declare and regulatory guidelines also so regulatory guidelines especially you know every right from the village panchayat to the you know highest to cds in india so whatever the local and national regulations that comes up we are supposed to follow them also okay so regulatory guidelines should be followed next one next principle is risk benefit uh, so ratio so we should check that you know whatever we are doing it is within the you know so, uh, so bracket where the benefit is most importantly for the participants okay it should not you know kill like the tuskegee uh, trial what uh, chinmay mentioned where syphilis patients were included into syphilis study where they are supposed to you know they don't give any treatment even the penicillin is available they they, they just keep on you know, they infect the person they just want to study the you know, study the you know life cycle of the syphilis which is completely you know not done it, it cannot be accepted that's why you know like uh, that is completely you know uh, that helped us uh, that uh, that is the one which uh, you know provoked us to you know come up with more stringent guidelines so we should ensure that whatever we do is as per the benefits risk benefit ratio is considered and advantages should always take the you know upper hand next is primary concerns about the subjects rights safety and well being should be taken care i will try to get into the next one by one because so each and every concept is elaborated in you know various presentations i'll try to rush into this positive development experience you know whenever you know uh, you are including a drug for trial so previous trial if it is your th third uh, you know third phase phase 3 then phase 2 should be you know uh, safe and a uh, uh, outcome should be you know acceptable then only you can do phase 3 so like that you know previously if you have done any you know preclinical or uh, Uh, micro dosing studies or phase 1 2 3 anything so if the earlier phases is good then you can you know your experience is good you can get into not only in the clinical and also in the preclinical and also in the any other supporting trial so next part of most important concept is you should have a well defined protocol okay scientifically sound and uh, oh, it is clear and it is completely detailed about the all the procedures what you are going to follow so all these things should be properly defined and properly written then only you should go to the ethics committee and get it approved and then you should implement it okay so next one is ethical clearance now the or uh, whatever you have written earlier in the protocol so same thing should be run through the uh, ethics committee for their unconditional written approval okay so they should not say that you know you can do this after that and you can do this no 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 it should not be like that means uh, like you know you should ensure that you have all cleared all the doubts of the ethics committee all the requirements of ethics committee and then take uh, take the next uh, stage 
okay so that is what i would like to say here what the regulations expect so unconditional return you know approval and any any you know deviation should not be applied okay unless it is brought back to the ethics committee and then inform them and then take their consensus or approval and then go for it may be minor or major or administrative everything should be brought to the ethics committee you know notification study should be conducted in compliance with the approved protocol so this is very important everyone should every clinical researcher should follow more most importantly who should do the caring of the patient or the subject most importantly very properly qualified physician to should take the responsibility suppose you are doing a you know dental trial then dentist should be there if it is a homeopathic then md nopia homeopathy should be there in the panel as the investigator or if it is a, any 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 you know like cardiology study then cardiology should be there so like that properly qualified experienced person should be able to do the decisions on the on the responsibilities of ensuring the safety of the patient or the subject should be done by the properly qualified decision maker okay and care should be provided by the qualified physician and it's not only always you know physician will do the work he can employ others also and delegate the work accordingly you know according to their quality qualification experience and their ability and then another most important how to what is the meaning of qualified staff means that the person is properly education educational qualification degree or a particular post graduate degree whatever that is mandated that should be there and the person should be trained in that particular work and then the person should be experienced also you know like see just to, as you know that universities they do the education but we don't can't assure you that you know they are independently able to manage everything so it can be done only after gaining you know assurance by experience okay so proper experience in the particular area should be there ensure you know like all the like education training and experience like what we are doing now online conference so this will be a documentation so like this everything should be documented and it should be made available for the purpose of auditing whenever whenever site audit is there whenever investigator audit audits are happening or a trial happening audits are happening at that time you should be able to provide all these data and every trial should be initiated after taking the voluntary consent from the subjects who are participating in the trial so all the consent should be taken during before the trial before the trial initiation any procedure before initiating any procedure you should be able to you know take the consent and then suppose if there is any change in the information safety issues are happened in some other site somewhere else in the country or another country and that should be again informed to the patient and again that should be you should be able to take additional consents as and when the uh, you know study evolves or the safety information evolves and compensation should be mentioned you know like study information safety information compensation information ethics committee related details everything i think you know more uh, more speakers will talk about this then uh, confidentiality confidentiality should be maintained throughout the study you know like uh, you know all the you know all the studies should be kept under security uh, you know security as per the guidelines and the hipaa guidelines should be followed you know like so like that you know so so um, subject records and uh, uh, all their privacy information you know like identifiables okay so um, these things should not be shared you know like so that especially sub uh, identification information of the particular subject should not be shared to the sponsors or any others it should be kept under lock and key but you can you know mask the information about the particular identifiables and then share to the sponsors next one is clinical trial data it should be recorded okay so it should be recorded and handled and stored see whenever any regulators comes to you for the audit purpose at that time you should be able to show the records okay so data is everything and unless it is documented it is not done means okay so that is what uh, you know regulator says so we should always ensure that whatever we do whatever the way we do it it should 
should be recorded and it should be shown for the purpose of auditing auditing and interpretation and verification okay next is most importantly that is investigational products it should be manufactured and handled and stored as per the good manufacturing practices this is another important guideline and it should be everything should be mentioned in the protocol and it should be done as per the protocol and the ethics committee approval should be taken the last one but not the least one here you can see that the principal most important principle quality assurance of every aspect of the clinical trial it is pre study during the study and post study it should be done okay so this is all about the about the principles of you know ICH GCP thank you so much for giving me the opportunities to speak here and uh, so chinmay can you take over thank you so much sir uh, it was a nice uh, explained sir uh, nicely explained the principles If yeah you can so any... i will i will end the presentation okay is there a way i can end it are you you were able to see yeah you are able to take over yes yeah. sir yes yes thank you so our uh, moving to our next speaker of today uh, dr uh, sambo samrat samajdar he has done his uh, mbbs md and dm in clinical pharmacology he is a highly accomplished clinical pharmacologist currently affiliated with uh, the school of tropical medicine in kolkata he holds a ms degree from rg kar medical college and hospital in kolkata and md in pharmacology from utkal university and a dm in uh, clinical pharmacology from the school of uh, tropical medicine where he received a gold medal dr samajdar has undergone extensive specialty training in a fellowship in respiratory and critical care from west bengal university of health sciences and diploma in allergy asthma and immunology affiliated with uh, bharati bharati vidyapeeth teamed university with uh, gold medal and uh, additionally uh, he has completed various other courses and certification in the field of endocrinology diabetes management and evidence based medicine dr samajdar has uh, an impressive research around having presented 25 research uh, original research papers at national and international conferences 56 articles in indexed journals and authored 18 book chapters his contribution field have been recognized through prestigious awards including the indian academy of diabetes award innovation award 2022 Uh, the dr jc patel and bc mehta best paper award uh, j association physicians india 2020 the young researcher award 2022 from the institute of scholars dr samajdar is a south after uh, speaker having uh, delivered 370 le lectures at various national and international forum currently he works as a consultant at the allergy asthma treatment center at molali and the diabetes and allergy asthma therapy clinic in kolkata with this words i would like to invite uh, dr uh, Sam samrat samajda to deliver his talk thank you dr mahapatra for your kind introduction and i am really uh, thankful to dr shivamurthy and uh, for providing me this opportunity and uh, i think my screen is visible yes sir so we will discuss about this important topic indian and international regulations governing clinical research and as we are starting today's journey maybe i, I shall try to finish it by 20 minutes we'll try to touch upon this broad ob objectives like how to comprehend the indian regulatory framework for clinical trials to explore the international regulations for clinical research mostly we will focus on ema and us fda regulations and also we will try to understand some accelerated approval pathway and emergency use authorization so when we discuss about regulations it is important to understand the difference between guidelines and regulations so when we talk about guidelines that is a recommendation 
on how something should be performed. But when we talk about regulations, this is a law dictating how something must be performed. So when we discuss about guideline, that means we all know that wearing helmet is important while driving a bike. But at the same time, if government sanctions some fine, if I am not wearing helmet, so that is regulation. That comes under the regulations. So there is some difficulty in slide changing. I, yeah. So when we talk about the regulations and guidelines in India, we need, need to acknowledge our national regulatory body, the CDSCO, the Central Drugs Standard Control Organizations, and the Drug Controller General of India. The CDSCO is the national regulatory authority in India. It's just equivalent counterparts elsewhere, like in US, it's USFDA, in Europe, it is EMA. So this is an arm of the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare of Government of India. And its mission is to safeguard and enhance public health by assuring the safety, efficacy, and quality of drugs, cosmetics, and medical devices. And when we talk about DCGI, Drugs Controller General of India, this is an official. He is an official of CDSCO, who is the final regulatory authority for the approval of clinical trials in our country. His ambit, in addition, also extends to inspections of trial sites, inspections of sponsors of clinical research, and manufacturing facilities in the country, oversight of central drug testing laboratory in Mumbai, and some regional drug testing laboratory as also heading the Indian Pharmacopoeia Commission or IPC among various other roles, responsibilities of function. Whereas when we talk about our ICMR, the Department of Health Research and Indian Council of Medical Research, this ICMR is the apex body that is responsible for the formulation, coordination, and promotion of biomedical research. So it receives funding from, again, the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare and the Department of Health Research of Government of India. So we need to understand these two bodies because when we talk about CDSCO, they give us some laws and regulations and ICMR provide us guidelines. So when we talk about the key regulatory documents and guidelines in clinical research in India, these are a few list of important regulatory documents and guidelines present in India starting from the Drug and Cosmetic Act and Drug and Cosmetic Rules to schedule Y to Indian Good Clinical Practice Guideline, which came in the 2001. Here, it is important to note the CDSU had prepared this guideline, whereas the guidelines for doing clinical research, the ICMR first time came up in 2000, had a revision in 2006. When we talk about stem cell research and therapy, ICMR came up with the first time in 2007, which was revised in 2013. And 2017, the latest national guidelines on stem cell research is available. And ICMR, the current guideline, we all know when we are doing clinical research, this is one of the fundamental book we need to go through. This is a beautiful guidelines. And we know what are the different parts of this ICMR guideline that helps us fostering clinical research in India. This is also a part of ICMR 2017 uh, guideline. Separately, they came up with a research guideline for doing clinical research involving children. Again, in the time of COVID, ICMR act promptly and give our ethical ethics committee a concrete guidelines on how to act, how to react during COVID-19 pandemic so that our research 
not suffer due to covidization and this is an interesting figure we can see here the green line is suggesting the number of trials that is increasing in southeast asia and even the low middle middle income uh, countries how after 2014 2016 there is a, there is a steep growth in terms of number of clinical trials and we are really proud that india is having now the fourth position in terms of number of trials and also important to note among those countries from the south asia or even the low middle income group of countries india's contribution is the maximum and due to that only we have the, 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 there is the steep rise in that section and here also we can see how the clinical trials increase and th there is a steep growth in 2019 that is almost 11 percent of global clinical uh, trial data was from india why there is an increasing growth there is a landmark thing happened in 2019 to make a smooth journey for any clinical trials to be conducted in India, and that is New Drug Clinical Trial Rules 2019, which give us easiness and increasing in doing increasing efficiency in doing clinical trial in India. That is New Drug Clinical Trial Rule 2019. This is we all know. When as an investigator, we are assigning exposure, that means we are doing some experimental study and that comes under the randomized control trial. It could be non-randomized also. And when as an investigator, I am not assigning the exposure, that is the observational study. To remember, if we, have, we are doing some clinical trial, we need to go through the, this document of new drug clinical trial rule 2019 thoroughly. And when we are doing observational study, we have this ICMR guideline to help us in conducting observational research. There is some overlap and that also mentioned in each guideline when to refer which guideline or which rule. So, According to new drug clinical trial rule 2019, we know clinical trial is defined as any systematic study of a new drug and or an investigational drug. So investigational new drug or new drug in humans to generate data for discovering or verifying its clinical pharmacological, which includes both pharmacodynamic and pharmacokinetic studies or adverse effects with the objective of determining safety, efficacy, or tolerability. This is a picture we all know. And when we are talking about IND, that means investigational new drug application, here is the area I am just showing in the slide here. We need to apply here after having all those preclinical studies. And when the regulators, here is the role of regulators, regulator will tell whether we can proceed for the clinical trials, starting from phase one to phase two and phase three clinical trials. Again, this is an area where we have to apply for new drug application or NDA. And here, again, there is a role of the regulators. They will decide whether the drug can be approved or not. There is an important area for generic drugs. For generic drugs, we know not, there is no need to go through all these steps. The, there is only a in vivo dissolution, in vivo BABE studies, bioavailability, bioequivalent studies, and in vitro dissolution studies, and some chemistry matching. And after that, that data, data is sub submitted to the regulators here, they will give us the, the, the permission whether go or no go or whether they will approve or not approve particular generics. So here it is important to mention, when we are talking about a new drug, we are talking about new drug application or NDA. But for generic drugs, we are talking in India, that is ANDA or abbreviated new drug application. And after that, we, have, we will have the phase four clinical trials. I think we have a separate sessions in details with new drug clinical trial rule 2019, 
I'm not going into uh, that to talk about all those important issues of new drug clinical trial rule 2019. Just want to focus one important point. When we talk about phase four clinical trial, there is an overlap between phase four clinical trial and post-marketing surveillance studies. So here I am giving one example of safety and effectiveness of empagliflozin with type two diabetes. That is a post-marketing surveillance study. Whereas if, if, we, if we see this type of studies, like similarly, empagliflozin effectively lowers liver fat content in well-controlled type 2 diabetes, a randomized double-blind phase 4 placebo-controlled trial. So here it is, phase 4 placebo-controlled trial. So what is the difference between phase 4 trials and post-marketing surveillance? It is clearly mentioned in our new drug clinical trial rule 2019. First of all, the phase four trials, they are conducted post-approval, identify less common adverse reactions, cost and drug effectiveness are evaluated. This type of trials have more pragmatic view. The, in this type of trials, we have more external validity. So pre-marketing studies, they are limit, there are some limitations like in detecting rare adverse drug reactions. And for that, these phase four studies can help us. But it is important to mention, this should be related to approved ind indication. So when we are talking about empagliflozin liver fat, we need to know they had clearly mentioned the, that study was done in type two diabetes, not for non-diabetic individuals. So if they want to do it in non-diabetic individuals, then it will not come under this phase four. It could be phase two or phase three, depending on the situation. So this trial should go beyond the prior demonstration of the drug safety, efficacy, and dose uh, definition, include additional drug-drug interaction, dose response, or safety studies designed to support use under the approved indication only. The difference between post-marketing surveillance is drugs to be provided in case of phase four, it should be provided freely. Whereas the post-marketing surveillance, there is not that requirement, mandatory requirement, that discretion of the applicant. Design as per the study protocol, but post-marketing surveillance, this should be done under the according to the prescribing information. So compensation is applicable for phase four clinical trial, whereas post-marketing surveillance, there is no need of post uh, compensation. Also, phase four clinical trial requires some fees, whereas PMS does not require any fees. So this is something really they had differentiated between phase four and post-marketing surveillance. Uh, I am not again go, go, go through this busy slide, but it is important to note when we are talking about any new drug that should come under uh, after the permission from the our regulators, the center, central licensing authority, that is the CDSCO. And when we have to apply for the new drug uh, trial, we need to wait that there could be a 90 working days review timelines and 30 working days for some, case, uh, some drugs which is uh, discovered and researched in India only. For old drugs, for doing academic clinical trials, generally we do not require CDSU approval. We do not require CDSU approval only the institutional review board or independent ethics committee, they, their permission is will be enough. So, but sometimes the institutional ethics committee or institutional review board, they may be confused whether this is a true uh, academic clinical trial or it, it should come under the regulatory trials. So for that thing, they need to submit, they need to ask the CDSCO, and they need to wait for some times, maybe around 30 days. If some information is not coming within 30 days, beyond 30 days, no need to uh, wait. They can give permission uh, for academic clinical trial as per their discretion. So this is something for BABE studies, we all know we need to take the permission from the CLA. And when we talk about import and manufacturing of new drug, 
there are certain areas in uh, our new drug clinical trial rules, certain forms are typically present. If we go through those forms, we'll get to know about uh, how the procedures. Now coming to the European Medics Medicine Agency, the EMA, their guideline, we'll discuss a little bit about them. So there is a 28 European U Union member states, along with some 4,500 European experts. The European Union Parliament and European Commission, they are also engaged here. They have a EMA management board and finally a EMA secretariat. So when the decision has been made by the EMA secretariat, they will give the, their recommendation to European Union Commission and European Union Commission finally will uh, sanction that this is this drug is approved or this drug is not approved like that. There are some annotations uh, come into my slides. I'm requesting the organizer to please omit those uh, annotation if possible. So when we uh, talk about their function, their main role is to protect and promotion of public and animal health. So it is also important to note that when we talk about EMA, they do not control these issues like pricing of medicines, access to medicines, advertising of medicines, patents on medicines, medical devices. We know that in, in India, the CDSCO is also regulating the medic, medical device things, the phytopharmaceutical things. But here, the EMA, they are not actually governing, not control the food supplements or cosmetics or homeopathic medicines. So EMA secretariat, there are multiple uh, areas, multiple important committees they have. Uh, the CHMP, they are in generally control this process of drug regulation. Apart from that, they have pediatric committee, Herbal Medicine Product Committee, Pharmacovigilance Risk Assessment Committee, the Advanced Therapy Committee, Orphan Medicinal Product Committee, and separate Veterinary Medicinal Product Committee. So EMA Secretariat, this is very important to note, they have different committees, like in Pediatric Committee or Pharmacovigilance Risk Assessment Committee, uh, SCAT Committee or COMP Committee, the patient members are also involved. Now the question, are all medicines approved via the EMA? The answer is no, because in the European Union, there are two ways of getting marketing authorization for a medicine. The number one step... <laughs> Yeah, so am I audible? Yes, 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 you can go ahead. Okay, so the number one is the centralized. Hello? Please, mute your mic. Yes, 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 and another is the national authorization procedures. Centralized authoriz authorization procedure that is via the European Commission after evaluation by EMA, which results in a single marketing authorization that valid throughout the European Union. But when we talk about national authorization procedures, they are generally for the generic products, generic drugs. So there are again three options. It could be national auth authorization, or it could be mutual recognition procedures, or it could be decentralized procedure. So when we talk about European Union centralized procedure, there are certain drugs, especially the new drugs that, in, that may include some biotech products like recombinant DNA technology pro products, gene expressed protein products, monoclonal antibodies, new active substances in specific therapy area like AIDS, cancer, neurodege neurodegenerative disorder, diabetes, autoimmune disease, or other immune deficiencies, some viral disease, even the orphan drugs, they, are, they should go through this single application procedures via European Union centralized procedure. There is a single authorization and direct access to all European Union states along with Norway, Iceland, Iceland and 
like in stain. Optional for any other new active substance that is significant for innovation or uh, this is also optional, the generic of centralized reference product. And when we talk about mutual recognition procedure and decentralized procedure, they are generally for the generics. So mutual recognition procedure, the important point is for products with already having a existing authorizations, member states authorization. And for decentralized procedures, this is only possible if no authorization has already been granted. And significant difference with the mutual recognition procedure is this should be done under the consultation between member states before the member states authorization the issued for the first time. So this is a difference between that. And these are the different scientific committees associated with EMA. Now coming to FDA, FDA, we need to know these two important uh, pathway. One is innovation drug products pathway and another is the generic drug products pathway. When we talk about innovation drug product pathway, there, there is a two important steps. One is investigational new drug. That means the from the preclinical study, the drug is entering into the clinical trial. So that is the thing. That is the time when they are applied to USFTA for having the IND approval. And then after doing the phase three clinical trial, when they are submitting in the FDA for new drug application. So that is another steps. And for generic drugs, like in India also, we are following the same, the abbreviated new drug application uh, is there. So this is in nutshell what happened in US when we are talking about uh, investigational new drug application. And this is the center for drug evaluation and research. The center for drug evaluation and research, this is, they will review the thing and they have different subcommittees starting from medicinal, chemistry, pharmacological, to or toxicological and statistical. And they will take the decision and tell the final body of US FDA. So again, when new drug application happen, that is also the, the applicants or drug sponsor will file to the new drug application to the FDA. And then again, the review will be done by CDER, Center for Drug Evaluation and Research. And there are certain other committees also here you can see, apart from medical pharmacology, chemistry, statistics, they also have a microbiology team, biopharmaceutical team, and there are constant meeting with the sponsors and other advisory committees also that happen. And when we talk about ANDA, there is an important review by the Office of Generic Drugs. There is a separate office for generic drugs along with the CDEA. They will review and there will be a bioequivalence review, chemistry review, labeling review. Labeling review, why it is important? The interchangeability, whether the generics are can be interchangeable or not. So this is very important steps for the generic drug approval. There are certain important uh, expedited drug approval pathway, starting from fast track uh, pathway, which facilitated the development and expedite the review of drugs to treat serious conditions and fill an unmet medical need. So this fast track designation must be requested by sponsor at any time during drug development process. So the, please note this any time during the drug development process and FDA decision within 60 days. So what sorry, are the- Sir, sorry to interrupt, sir. I shall finish by five minutes, please. Sir, please finish it up within two minutes, sir. Two minutes? Okay. Yes, so what does a sponsor get here? There will be more frequent meetings with FDA. There will be more frequent written communications from FDA and eligibility to accelerated approval and priority review. There is a possibility of rolling review. That means continuous review. The breakthrough therapy means, again, they will get all those fast track designation features. But it is important to note in the fast track, the sponsor can apply anywhere in the drug development process. But here it is important to note, I, 
we they can apply it beginning as early as phase one clinical trial, but not later than end of phase two clinical trial. And again, there, this type of therapy should demonstrate some significant endpoint. And when we talk about accelerated approval, uh, so they also by this accelerated approval to approve drugs for serious conditions with an unmet medical need based on surrogate endpoint. And sometimes they will also take some intermediate clinical endpoint. But for all those things, the phase four clinical trials required. Now this, when we talk about this PDE uh, UFA, which uh, can have two types of review. One is standard review, and another is a priority review. For priority review, they require six months. I think the two, two minutes is over, so I will not go in uh, much more, just showing you the slides. This is important, the emergency use authorization, these terminologies we, we learn when we face the COVID-19 pandemic. But I just want to focus, the, this emergency use authorization is separate from those things like priority review, accelerated approval, breakthrough. They, they are separate and this emergency use authorization is separate. This is only for the specific emergency circumstances, like some public health threat, military threats like that. So in US, they are calling it UA. When we talk about Euro, that is conditional marketing authorization. And when in India, the CDSCO, even before COVID-19, the new drug clinical trial rule, there was a provision of this restricted use in emergency. This option was there. And we should salute the farsightedness of our own drug regulators. This restricted use in emergency, they have certain benefits and we know how we get benefits in during the COVID-19 pandemic. So upholding the ethical principles ensures safe and responsible clinical research. Regulations govern every stage of the clinical trials nationally and internationally. And that is why we need to know about the regulations. Compliance and collaborations this drive the successful research outcomes. And we need to apply the regulatory knowledge to enhance credibility and patient welfare. I should acknowledge my guru, my mentor, Professor Shantanu Kumar Tripathi for this knowledge about these all things. And uh, thank you again, the organizer, for providing me this opportunity. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, sir, for uh, such a beautiful presentation. I hope, uh, thank you, thank you. All the since regulatory information. So uh, with this, uh, move to our uh, next speaker. I think Dr. Uh, Somnath Basu sir has joined us. Good, good evening, sir. Ah, good evening. Okay. Uh, I just want to, you know, thank uh, Dr. Sambo uh, for, you know, writing excellent article uh, uh, and giving us. It's very nice. At this time, you know, like uh, since we uh, we have we are getting a lot of questions, we'll pose it to, you know, uh, Dr. Sambo and uh, others uh, later because of the paucity of time. We will take them uh, and we will include them into the ebook later also. Okay, so please uh, pardon us uh, because of the time. Uh, we will uh, move forward. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. So now I would like to introduce our uh, chief guest, chief speaker of today, Dr. Uh, Somnath Basu, sir. Uh, he is the chief scientist E, and uh, currently he is working as a. Can you make it uh, PowerPoint uh, full uh, full screen? Yes, sir. I have made it, sir. Is only half visible. Maybe can you try again? Uh, check the boxes, no? what we discussed last time. Yes, yes, yes. Is it okay now, sir? Fine. All right. Fine. So, Dr. Samnath Vasi, sir, he has completed his BSc in chemistry, MSc in uh, biochemistry, and PhD from Calcutta. He had worked as a drug analyst for around seven years at uh, CDL, Calcutta. He is having more than 10 years of experience in reviewing clinical, non-clinical and uh, CMC data or reports submitted by the companies for drug 
while working with uh, CDS. He has also worked in uh, vaccine documents for six years. Then he worked in Dozier for uh, blood products, medical devices, recombinant technology, derived drugs for uh, another seven years and currently working as uh, periodic safety update report review since last three years. He has attended various international conferences of uh, CDR, CBR, USA, and WHO headquarters in Geneva for vaccine vigilance, PMDA in Japan for pharmacovigilance, and uh, Santiago in Chile, Chile for uh, global in initiative for vaccine vigilance and also participated as in various national and international seminars. Uh, currently, he is working as a uh, quality manager, uh, QMS and regulatory at uh, AM at Visa of uh, He was the ex, uh, uh, just now he has uh, left that CDSU office because I, I was in uh, talks with him. So um, he was the deputy drug controller of uh, India and at the CDSU. With this, uh, what I would like to uh, invite uh, Somnath Basusar to um, take over the mic and uh, Sir, uh, as, as per our uh, schedule, sir, uh, we have planned to release the ebook. So, for okay. that, uh, you can carry on, sir, like uh, you and Dr. Sivamurti, sir. Yes, yeah. sir. Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon, sir. It's my appreciation, so kind of you, all of you, that you have invited me in this August gathering. So we can proceed your, as per your. Yeah, so uh, sir, uh, mm. uh, like if you permit, uh, like, you know, maybe you can announce that, you know, release of the books uh, so that uh, I will follow your instructions. Yeah. So I hereby uh, want, I'm very pleased to release the books wherein various articles are uh, articulated in a, of a good manner and it is uh, worthy to read and I would suggest everybody to read all the articles. I have certain note here also on the new drug clinical trial rule 2019. So hereby doctors, I hand over the microphone to Dr. Siva Murthy. Uh, yes, sir, as per your you know, suggestion, now I'm just opening, opening the document uh, for the release of uh, this uh, a book on ebook on clinical trial management. Uh, so, with your permission, now it is visible to all. Uh, I uh, request uh, means what I'm saying is uh, at this moment I will be sharing a copy to all the participants, even though like you know it is written by all the uh, you know speakers. And also, it is having 22 chapters. You can see here, right from the you know first chapter uh, overview of the drug development uh, to then you know we have so many. All the speakers have put in lot of efforts, uh, and uh, they have come up with very interesting articles. Uh, so till you can see also challenges faced in various scenarios and uh, including fraud and misconduct and investigational product management like this. So every aspect of the clinical trial is covered in this. I mean, so whatever the latest guidelines are also referred and uh, the full article is, you know, have, uh, written uh, whatever the, you know, Dr. Shambhu sir was saying uh, that, you know, all the article, all the related guidelines and uh, every speaker, I would say that, you know, not only Dr. Shambhu and uh, including uh, everywhere, all the, papa, you know, speakers, what I can say here, uh, Dr. Gayatri, Dr. Uh, Renu, uh, Renuka, Anyogi, and then Dr. Mita, Madam, uh, so, uh, projects are uh, so like this. There are a lot of people, you know, very senior level people. They have, you know, uh, they have put in their efforts since last one month. We have made so much of efforts. Uh, so this is the last page of the, uh, you know, book. And I will be dropping this one copy. Now, what I request is that, you know, every uh, everyone who is, you know, part of this program. To, uh, now I am sharing in a minute. Okay, so kindly, uh, you know, all of you to 
all of you to open in your uh, in your uh, uh, mobile and show it to the camera so that uh, uh, we can take uh, nice you know um, screenshots uh, screenshots at this time uh, so that this will be a kind of you know release ceremony uh, as per uh, dr uh, uh, basu sir's instruction so i just yeah. dropped i request everyone to open your whatsapp group whatsapp in the participants group okay. so can everyone just you know uh, open the document uh, and uh, uh, you know can you open and uh, show, open your uh, mobile also and show it to the world that you know this uh, document is now uh, visible and uh, uh, you, available yeah forwarded have you forwarded the book yes sir just i just forwarded so uh, i think it is visible to everyone uh so uh can all of you show i think uh, who is taking the screenshot namamita or uh, uh, rituparna so any of you are there uh yes sir uh, can you request, take this yeah yes, can you i would request the delegates uh, to have their mobile phones on with the screenshot yeah yeah so i am just showing can you take the full screenshot of you know all the people who are showing the uh, this document yes sir done thank you it is done okay now thank you so much for the release uh, now sir uh, uh, basu sir uh, uh, dr chinmay can you take over the presentation and uh, put it into the uh, like is a sir presentation and then we can proceed with the next presentation uh, yes sir so uh, basu can present now sir hello can, can. hello sir you is can uh, muted you can unmute sir so can you just call in because i think uh, it is muted for him now hello yes sir yes, yes. sir now screen can share can you project the slides yeah uh, screen share i am sharing yes sir it's visible it's coming sir yes sir it is visible can you make it full screen sir moving ha huh? i yes. have done yes sir screen. Yes, full visible, sir. Visible yes, sir. and Go full ahead, screen. Sir. Full screen. Okay, fine. Nice. I have a worry, and sometimes I have happened. It has happened that there is a glitch, and I could not proceed. I mean, it's moving but not full screen. So thank you very much for all this and this August gathering of the learned people and those who are associated with the clinical research area in in this country. Uh, everybody, I think, know about the 2013-14 case, Supreme Court case, then Swast Seva Manch. all that happened and that was a uh, big upset at that point of time but many good things also happened by with that trigger i would say sometimes uh, please respond to my question so that i would uh, understand that everybody is uh, when i mean uh, it's like a, i can't understand that whether my voice is going there or properly it's going or not so my slide is about the decoding of the regulations and what one should know about new drugs and clinical trial rules 2019 um so this is my introduction and i also kept one drugs and cosmetics uh, books view and also the clinical research uh, setting how it can happen uh, how it should be like in a spacious area it can happen so that's the image disclaimer this is a disclaimer that this is not my hello 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 is it okay yes you are audible you are audible and uh, 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 slides are moving yes sir acha so now my presentation is about regulation what is drugs act is it visible yes sir oh then fine it's okay so what is drugs act this act was made in uh, uh, in 19 uh, government of india 1935 act mane pre it's a pre independence act so under british regime it was uh, done by rn chopra committee rn chopra committee was a drug inquiry committee was there 
it was set up by britishers only uh, on the basis of the some note from uh, uh, cornell doctor from uh, lahore area uh, to the british government that there is substandard medicines are being supplied and that uh, those days may not many medicines were used only quinine uh, in abundantly used and some other medicines might have been used so so with that act and uh, uh, british government introduced uh, in 1940 the drugs act and still we are keeping this 1940 uh, year as a historic uh, event and uh, recently there is a bill going to, uh, has been uh, passed into the lok sabha uh, that is decriminalization of various laws and also there is a drugs cosmetics and medical device combination bill will be placed in the uh, in the lok sabha uh, but there are a lot of uh, public hue and cry and industrial stakeholders there um, making various noise on that so anyway we have to go back to the history only. So this is the act and under act, there is a rule. So what is act? Act is a decree that is approved by the respective legislature. It may be a state legislature or it may be parliament of India like uh, our Lok Sabha and Rajya Sabha. And these bills are actually bills in the form of bills it is uh, introduced into the Lok Sabha. And when it is passed by Lok Sabha and Rajya Sabha, then president puts his signature. Then the, this bill comes to be an act. So after this 1940, there is no act has been, uh, or no bill has been introduced on the drugs regulations in the country. But this is the first time actually we were working many years in uh, my, uh, previous years, but uh, probably this time it may go uh, past it. Now rules, what are the rules? Rules are laws framed by the government authority, like in the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare, our joint secretary is the authority. And when he puts signature on certain rule statements, that becomes that appears in the form of the gadget notification, and I think all might have seen this uh, in the our cdsu.gov.in. If you go through, you will get this kind of gadget notification very often on various issues. Recently, the cup syrup issue has come up with the D G D ethylene glycol issue. As all you of, all of you know, that Gambia case and Uzbekistan case has really shaken our government. That what is happening? How? Where is the fault? So they are in the fault finding mood and also in the kind of uh, uh, renovating or overhauling the system. So this is the thing. Achha, next slide I am showing, Chinmaya uh, ji, can you respond that? Are you looking at the Central Duck Standard Control Organization slide here? Yes, sir. Yeah, correct. So this is the, uh, I, I have taken a screenshot of the Central Duck Standard. This is cdsu.gov.e. This is not the Shugam portal. This is the cdsu.gov.e. Here you will find uh, our activities in the form of icons, like uh, there is home menu and about us and then act and rules, BAB, anywhere you, if you click, you will get a summary and then a uh, little bit of the information there you will get. Clinical trial, biologics, cosmetics, DTAB, DCC, uh, drugs and international cell, medical device and diagnostics. So I have put here the gadget notification in the search box, right hand extreme. So there, if you find gadget notification, you will get the gadget notification, series of gadget notifications. So next slide, I have put also in the search that ethics committee, then you will get the, uh, the yellow marked, yellow marked uh, is a, uh, uh, yellow marked area is the, uh, regarding the ethics committee on the clinical trial of bioequivalence and bioavailability studies, which are also considered under the clinical trial regulations. Next slide. What happens? Yeah. Yeah. Abhi nahin. Baad mein hai. Ab mein baand kar dunga ab sir. Taala lu chhod ke jao, mein laga dunga. So what is the new regulation uh, in India for clinical trial of medicines? It is the new drug clinical trial. Uh, ah, okay. Which authority and when this law has been enacted? Ministry of Health, Government of India, Gadget Notification, GSR 227, 19th March. What is the predecessor? As everybody knows, I think all are aware, Schedule Y, and that was a part of the kind of guideline form in the drugs and cosmetic rule. 
So what was the objective of introducing this fresh way of the NDCT rule? To refine the old guidelines schedule Y by replacing with a comprehensive separate rule for regulation of the clinical trial, manufacture, import of the new drugs and investigational new drugs and ethics committee in India at par with the international practices. How much time I have? Can you imagine? Sir, you can continue, sir. We have okay. time. So which products are currently regulated under DNC Act? I have listed all these products, all medicines in various formulations and also APIs. APIs is active pharmaceutical ingredient. Suppose you are going to manufacture, let's say, norfloxacin. So it is in the powder form. That is also regulated under this rule. Medical devices, all medical devices under risk-based classifications, A, B, C, D, and all cosmetics. Then there is a vaccine, vaccine for human, vaccine for poultry, cattle, or animal vaccines, all animal vaccines, uh, cattle, poultry, or any other, uh, dogs, uh, feline, or uh, canine, all. And then blood products, uh, IVIG, and uh, factor eight, factor nine, all these. Then RDNA products like rituximab or bevacizumab, or let's say canakinumab is there, and trastuzumab. So those uh, omalizumab, these drugs are RDNA products by uh, manipulation of the E. coli genes or plasmid, it is produced in a separate set of uh, technology. Then stem cell products, that is the stem cell derived products, we can collect stem cells from our, uh, like uh, from the umbilical cords of the newborn babies, and so stem cell or from the adipose tissues. And gene therapeutics is also there and then uh, blood banks, but these are the newer field. So um, as regulator, as well as the manufacturers uh, are also, uh, not knowing many of the things in the gene therapeutic products and stem cell products. And blood banks also we regulate under this rule and I use products and <laughs> phytopharmaceuticals. <laughs> phytopharmaceuticals also. Next slide is that there are, uh, so uh, there are rules like under this act, Drugs and Cosmetics Act, we have drug rules 45, then new drug clinical trial rule 19. Another rule is cosmetic rule that is in 2020. So who, which is the authority? Authority is currently CDSU and State Drug Control Department with uh, separate jurisdictions. Uh, area of jurisdiction is different for CDSU and State Drug Control Authority. And uh, CDSU work under Directorate General of Health Services, uh, Government of India. It is It comes under the Cabinet Ministry, Ministry of Health and Family Welfare. Price Control Authority, NPPA, is a different, that is Department of Pharmaceutical, and that goes under the uh, Ministry of Chemical and Fertilizer. So altogether, a separate ministry controls the pricing of the medicines in the country. Allied organizations with us, uh, DBT, ICMR, all other programs in health, Ministry, Department of Animal Husbandry, and Dairy. Manufacturer, so what is the uh, basic philosophy? Basic philosophy of drug regulation is that Basic philosophy of the drug regulation is that manufacturers or importers are responsible for quality of the products which is being placed in the market. The regulatory principle by a system of licensing, permission, there are certain terms like one is the permission, another is the licensing, then periodic inspection goes on. We have a huge cadre of uh, drug inspectors now. Basically, they are qualified from the M pharmaceuticals, uh, M pharma and sampling of the products also taken place and test those samples are uh, tested at the government labs as well as government approved labs so that is the basic principle of our regulations one is the documents checking at the uh, internally in the office and then giving permissions on there is a subject expert committee also we also take the recommendation of subject expert committee in case of the new drug approval so that is the basic things what we do in the regulations now, government regulatory agencies monitor quality of the drugs by periodic inspection of the uh, manufacturing premises as well as sale premises for conformation to the DNC Act and monitoring the quality of drugs by post market surveillance, sampling. Like post marketing surveillance is given to the IPC as a wing, and they are looking after there. But PSUR review, that is that CDSU is doing currently. Now, what is the function of the CDSCO? CDSCO's function is an overview of the uh, whole policy making things. Uh, first time approval of the new drugs and new devices in India, permission for clinical trials on medicines and medical device, both import licensing of the medicines, bulk and finished both, 
and devices licensing of the blood banks import of the but licensing of the blood bank is a uh, dual authority might like state in the state where blood bank is located that state authority will produce the license part and they will send it to dcgi for approval with all documents inspection documents also now import of the cosmetics licensing of the ethics committee uh, this is a recent phenomenon after that supreme court order uh, the ethics committee registration i mean almost five years now has happened so it has started now manufacturing license of the lvps large volume parenteral vaccine rdna products blood products and devices amendment to the drugs and cosmetics act and rules and banning of the drugs cosmetics and medical devices so sometimes it requires that rofecoxib there was a requirement of banning rofecoxib so we did it by of course there should be a database in the country but unfortunately that has not happened so we always depend upon the outside data now uh, still uh, pharmacovigilance program is going on with that data um, also take we take into consideration and sometimes there is a requirement of banning of the drugs or prohibition or restricted use like nimesulide it is restricted that below 12 years you cannot use so those kind of uh, decisions are taken by at the dcgi office now i come coming to the state authorities powers i mean jurisdiction state authorities function is licensing of the manufacturing site suppose you are going to manufacture uh, you have taken a plot and you are going to manufacture paracetamol in the factory that that factory is located in andhra pradesh then andhra pradesh drug control will give you the manufacturing site permission and the product permission so whether it is api manufacturing active pharmaceutical in, ingredient in the powder form the chemical or the finished formulation both are under the jurisdiction of uh, state drug control department and licensing of these all cell premises all pharmacies pharmacies are actually licensed under uh, uh, cell license 20b and 21b and currently for medical device exclusively there is a license 42 uh, form 42 i am talking about some forms number um, but forget about that uh, those are all available in the drugs and cosmetic rule uh, the point to be taken is that there are certain forms of licenses with certain commitments there with certain conditions there that you have to put the one of the condition is that you have to put the cell license at your premises such kind of conditions are there uh, you cannot disallow any drug inspector to visit your premises so those kind of commitments and conditions are given there um, and then recall of the substandard drugs and overall implementation of the drug and cosmetics act and provisions in the state jurisdiction that is under the state control now uh, administration of drugs so if we look at there are four columns four pillars one is the advisory kind of thing dtab and dcab dcc uh, dtab and dcc drug technical advisory board this is a technical advisory board and another is the dcc that is how to implement the technical decision taken or laws taken that is given by the dcc so these two authorities like lok sabha and rajya sabha whatever rule you are framing you have to pass through lok sabha and rajya sabha so they are like in our drug control division, the DTAB and DCC are lo like Lok Sabha and Rajya Sabha. If they pass, the law will be enforced in the country, all over the country. Executive is the licensing authority. So central and state licensing authorities. Are... Oh, 15, 15. Karunga. Okay. Fifteen. Uh, okay. So licensing authority then need it. Central drug laboratory is the another analytical uh, lab and drug control laboratories in the state. Then there and judiciary. Judiciary is another uh, because judiciary any complaint or any uh, like PLI public litigation that is addressed by the judiciary system. Now, this is a sketch where I have put the, the Drug and Cosmetics Act, how the genesis of the new drug clinical trial rule has happened. And this has, the precursor was Schedule Y in the Drug and Cosmetic Rule. And schedule, schedules, all schedules are basically guidelines, but mandatory guidelines. It is not like US FDA guideline. They say, they put on the US FDA that it is not mandatory. If you have any reasons, you can give in writing and FDA may consider. Here it is not. In the Drug and Cosmetics Act, Wherever there is a schedule, means it is mandatory guideline. Manufacturer as an importers and uh, clinical trialist, everybody has to follow. 
So there are this number of forms and schedules, eight schedules, 107 rules and chapters 13. Next is that uh, scope is that investigational new drug DAV study, conduct of clinical trial. Uh, hi, anything is there? Anybody asking? Chinmayji, Dr. Siva. Sir, it's going on fine, sir. Not, no problem. Okay. Ethics committee, then uh, biomedical and health research ethics committee, import of unapproved drugs. And last yes, is sir. the market huh? surveillance studies. So there is key features is that in this rule that we have put, we, 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 we were able to put the timeline defined timeline and license fees for applications. So license fix, fees is increased and also a timeline. We, in a timeline, timeline earlier was there, but that was a government order. Now in the rule book framing timeline is a big change. That means we are committing with the public that uh, we will dispose our, uh, uh, our uh, documentations or review in a time frame, 90 working days or something. So we need not to memorize that, but there is a time frame that has happened. Now, this is the regulatory pathway in general for a company. Company uh, do the R&D research, R&D study that gener um, with that data, they go into the preclinical studies in the rat, mice, or sometimes it is dogs, or sometimes in certain vaccines, it may be ferrets like that. So preclinical data uh, boost up the, and also the put the courage to enter into the human trial and phase one trial, you know, phase two, three, those things happen and then the whole data that is regulatory submission is given to the national regulatory agency. All over the world, the same process is going on. And then approval and licenses are given by the de regulatory authority. After that, that does not finish. There is a cycle. Cycle is that after that approval and license, you have to do the phase four trial uh, and phase four CT, phase four clinical trial, and also active and passive surveillance and PMS studies. So now I, I'm coming to the chapter wise. Uh, the first chapter is the definition, unless the context of otherwise requires. So definition is the first chapter in the in this rule. And then see the chapter uh, academic clinical trial is described in this manner. When a drug is already approved for a certain claim, like metformin is approved for the uh, NIDDM, non uh, insulin dependent diabetes mellitus, type two diabetes mellitus metformin as a first line therapy. Now metformin is also uh, used for PCOS. So if somebody claims that I want to get it approved for PCOS, polycystic ovarian syndrome, then you have to uh, put the documentation as per the new drug claim. So new drug application. So new claim, new route of administration, paracetamol if you want to manufacture in a patch. So that is a new route of administration. New dose of or dosage form when the result of such trial will not be utilized uh, commercially by uh, any entity. Sorry, I am talking about the academic clinical trial. Academic clinical trial is the interest of the academic. So there is no commercial use. But of course, there is a, when there's, there must be some research questions which is going to be addressed through the academic clinical trial. So there is a new claim may happen or route of administration may happen different, but it should not be used in the, uh, in the uh, commercial use, the data. Next chapter is the adverse event. So these are the definition that is covered under chapter uh, one. Adverse events is the uh, untoward medical occurrences, including a symptom of the or disease or an abnormal laboratory findings during treatment with an investigational medicinal product in a patient or trial that does not necessarily have a relationship. This point is very important. That does not have a relationship with the treatment being given. Adverse event, but it is a reportable event. That's why this point uh, sentence is important. Second is the biomedical health research. That is research, including studies on basic applied and operational research or clinical research design primarily to increase about the scientific knowledge and condition, physical or socio behavior, their uh, detection and cause and evolving strategies for health promotion, prevention, amelioration of the disease and rehabilitation, but does not include the clinical trial as defined in clause J means the earlier one. Clinical trial in relation to a new drug, this is also defined there. Next thing is that clinical trial protocol. Protocol is also defined. That is a document containing background objective, rational design methodology, including matter uh, concerning performance management, conduct analysis, adverse events withdrawal, and statistical consideration and record keeping pertaining to the clinical trial. 
So this is the clinical trial protocol that has been defined in this manner. So all point here is important. Then efficacy in relation to the drug is ability to achieve the desired effect in controlled clinical setting, that is efficacy. Effectiveness, drugs ability to achieve the desired effect in real world clinical situation after approval of the drug. Now there is a definition of the GCP guideline that is guideline that has been formulated and published by CDSC. Global clinical trial, a trial which has multi-country centers, that is global clinical trial. So in this manner, there are many definitions available in this chapter. Orphan drug definition is available, pharmacovigilance available, placebo available, that inactive substance visually identical in appearance to a medicinal product being tested in a clinical trial. And vigilance, of course, you know, in a WHO de definition is put here, that is science and activities relating to detection, assessment, understanding, and prevention of the adverse events. Prevention. So prevention, are we doing really? We don't know because we are still collecting in the collecting phase and assessment is going on. Signal detection team is there working in the IPC in pharmacovigilance and material vigilance. So these are the definitions here. Now, another definition is that this is important, phytopharmaceutical drug. Phyto, are you, is it visible, this phytopharmaceutical? Yes, sir. Oh. Sir, uh, sir, if you can complete in five minutes, sir. Ah, okay, okay. Then I'm going, um, uh, going to the, there are many slides actually. So, okay. So what is new drug, if I go, that modified release tablets, sustained release tablets, novel drug delivery system, vaccines, RDNA derived product, living modified organisms, monoclonal antibodies, stem cell xenografts, etc. All are considered as a new drug. New drug means what does it mean? New drug. What is the reason for putting into the new drug definition? The, the, the reason is that if you want to manufacture DTP, uh, triple antigen vaccine now by opening a factory, you have to submit all documents as per the new drug checklist. That is the objective. Okay, DTP is a very old vaccine, almost 30, 40 years old vaccine. But if you want to manufacture here in the country, you have to do through the all process of clinical trial and all that. That is why the, uh, the under the definition new drug, it is put. So chapters are various activities of the control over medicines, medicinal products manufactured, imported and placed in the market are divided into the chapters with controlling rules and authorities. This is the uh, objective of the making all rules in the chapters. Chapter one, chapter two, like that. Chapter one is the preliminary. Then two is authorities and officers. Three, ethics committee for the city BAB study. Chapter four is EC for biomedical and health research. Five is for the city BAB study for ND and D. Then in six, uh, six, it is compensation, like that. So all these chapters are defined in this manner. Now, controlling rules are activities and authorities for control over the medicinal products described in these chapters. How these controls are put in place in all these chapters? There are rules. Like chapter two, there is, there is a definition that who is CLA? CLA is DCGI. Who are the controlling officer? Assistant drug controller, deputy drug controller, drug inspector, ADIs, those are. And what are their powers? That has been defined here. Now, chapter four, there is a Chapter four is a, there are many EC of the Biomed, uh, Ethics Committee of the Biomedical and Health Research. Chapter three is the Ethics Committee for CTBAB studies. And there are many things uh, um, attended here, like member secretary, who will be the member secretary? 50% of the members should be from the outside. Validity of the Ethics Committee registration will be for the five years. Functionings of the ethics, ethics Committee, there is a requirement of SOP, GCP. All these are written in these chapters. Then chapter five is for the CTBAB study. CT, BAB study of the ND and IND approval. Mane, if you want to do the clinical trial on a new drug, you have to get a license, I mean, permission from the DCGI, and then you have to go to the ethics committee for approval. So those license, what are the conditions, where to apply, how much fees to be given, all these are given in this chapter. Compensation part, there is another chapter. Chapter, so this chapter also covers all the sponsors, representatives shall give the compensation. There is a statement that sponsor and representative, whosoever is there, responsible, 
for taking the license a permission for the clinical trial they have to pay the compensation that statement is available there in this chapter so like this many chapters here chapter 8 9 uh, 10 and then 11 and 12 lastly 12 chapter is there then coming the schedules schedules are available in eight schedules are available first schedule is for the general principle and practices of the clinical trial design analysis development methodologies for one two three four studies on pediatric pregnancy and geriatrics conduct of the clinical trial analysis and reporting in format table everything is given in these schedules now second schedule is for the requirement guideline for import or manufacture of the new drug third schedule is for the informed consent investigator procedures structure format for the clinical trial reporting trial protocol Achha, in third schedule, mein, there is a noise. Third schedule, mein, prescribing information is available. Please note that in the red color. And prescribing information is very important because that gives the actual indication of the uh, medicine. Like uh, somebody can use bevacizumab. Bevacizumab is otherwise used for the uh, cancer treatment. Uh, and trastuzumab also. But bevacizumab also used as offline use in the macular degeneration by the ophthalmo. Um, or, 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 I mean, ophthalmology discipline, the surgeons. So prescribing the, the information is a very important uh, document of, uh, about the drug, which is agreed between the manufacturer and the regulator. That is given in the third schedule, the structure. Then uh, uh, after that, it is coming the next chapter, that is fourth schedule. Fourth schedule may be a B study, SOP, record maintenance, etc. given. Fifth schedule, fifth schedule is totally related to the post-marketing assessment. Uh, PSUR principle, PSUR content, PSUR submission, risk management plan, etc. Reference safety information, all these things. Then sixth schedule is for the orphan drug and for uh, application from MSME, farms fees pay, uh, payable would be half year. These conditions are there in sixth schedule. So there is a payment matters are given in the sixth schedule. And there is a compensation table is also given here. Eight schedule, then ethics committee chapter. Certain things I have spread it across in this slide that oh, 50 percent and then quorum fulfillment, and then what will be the composition, a lay person, woman, legal experts, all those things are uh, given in this chapter. Uh, features features of the EC ethics committee. Just look at that member secretary should be within the organization, but chairman should be outside. Those things are uh, available in this. Uh, features of the ethics committee in the uh, new drug clinical trial rule. And then what are the functions of the ethics committee that is also given there. And I have also collected the some certain commitments area of the sorry. Uh, commitments to be given by the member secretary and chairman of the ethics committee. This I think all of you are aware uh, that uh, one, two, three, four, you can get it into undertaking section. Uh, yeah. Then phase one objectives are given. Uh, PK studies are also given in the new drug clinical trial rule book. PK studies objectives are given. Phase two objectives are given. Phase three objectives are given. So take home message is that concern are always inherent about the quality and safety of the medicines. Strict regulatory standards are the over cornerstone for the modern medicines. Worldwide regulatory agencies monitor safety and efficacy of medicines in public. Indian medicine regulatory system started in the British regime. So I am going to end, uh, Chin Maji. Yes, sir. My, uh, the British regime, start of the 1990s, clinical trial CRO started coming. Actually, this happened with the our own uh, drugs regulator was there, drug controller, one Dr. P. Das Gupta. He is no more now. He died in uh, some one year or one year back. Yeah. So he actually is introduced first the schedule, first time in the schedule wise. And Schedule Y is the precursor of this new drug clinical trial rule. Mm -hmm. So Schedule Y was uh, inserted in the rule uh, in 1940, uh, the rule uh, that was inserted around 1989 or 90, Schedule Y. So that was the beginning of the clinical trial in 80, I mean, in late 80s, late 80s and early 90s. And that time IQVIA, now it is IQVIA, that time it was quintile research uh, they came into being first time the CRO. And controversies erupted about the unethical trials on the Indian patients in 2010. A Supreme Court hearing happened that Swast Seva Manch, Bhopal, Bhopal uh, they made the public litigations uh, in the Supreme Court. 
because um, they had many complaints and some are genuine actually many of them then uh, justice lodha committee they uh, heard all those things all stakeholders and then introduced so regulations for the ethics committee registration also started with that supreme court ruling only comprehensive and separate rules for activities of the guidelines uh, ndct 2019 over new bill for common act of the medicines are on the unveil that you all aware that there is a um, rumor going on i mean it's a fact not rumor in the ministry uh, there is a composition bill they are going to introduce medis medicines cosmetics and device so this is my end slide i think yeah this is the end slide i think i i i would be able to complete this the nice officer uh, <laughs> Thank you so much, sir. Sir, uh, I have uh, one small question, sir. Yeah, yeah, question, please. Indian, in Indian regulation, there is uh, no such uh, conditions mentioned for or regulations mentioned for phase zero clinical trial, but it is there in uh, European guidelines. Phase zero, phase zero is yeah. Uh, it's like uh, cautious. Uh, phase zero is uh, newly introduced. It is not uh, yes. In uh, here, it is not phase one. Uh, phase one say yeah, shuru. Uh, it started, but uh, yes, there yes. should be phase zero. Yeah, correct. Uh, Money, uh, micro quantity of the medicine to be put under trial. Uh, mm. yeah, please, sir. But I would like to one, thank you. One thing, I would sir, like I to... just, sir. Can you allow? Yes, yes. Please go ahead, uh, Doctor Shambhu. So, when we are talking about phase zero clinical trial, this is not. Actually, a regulatory clinical trial. Phase zero is not a regulatory clinical trial, and that is why new drug clinical trial rule is still not giving any em emphasis on this, because phase zero is something which can aid, which can help us to know about some pattern of maybe a pharmacodynamic pharmacokinetic uh, right. characteristics of a molecule. It's but kind it's of early phase of the regulatory. Issues till date. It is not a mandatory thing, and that that is why it is not mentioned. I think Sir can mention with uh, elaborate it. Maybe. Yeah, you are right, uh, Dr. Shambo. Actually, it is not mandatory. That's why it is not mentioned in the regulatory guidelines. And uh, now at this juncture, I would like to thank you, Sir. Uh, so, yeah. so much, Sir. It so is nice an excellent, you. excellent presentation. Thank you so much for thank releasing you. the book. And thank you for doing the honor. Your presence really made I'm us really, really. feel blessed. And uh, I would like to thank you very much for this from my thank side. You. So nice of you. Thank you to all of you. Yeah. Thank you so much, sir. So I'm uh, leaving. Eh? Yes, sir. So, Any question? Uh, we will send you the questions later, sir, for discussion. Okay. Fine. What fine. we will do, we are collecting all the questions and we'll try to add into the ebook, sir, later. In Actually, the end. Tomorrow, tomorrow you will have a session. Na? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. We will also have the session. Okay. So tomorrow, yes. uh, tomorrow is Sunday. I am free. Yes, sir. Yes, so sir. Yes. Can please do join, sir. Session, yeah. Yes, sir. Please. Thank you so much, sir. In uh, Sunday. Today I am busy in my MTJ, actually. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Definitely. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir. So now moving to our next speaker, Dr. Suyok Sindhu. She is uh, currently working as Associate Professor at the Department of Pharmacology and Therapeutics, KGMU. She, is an, uh, she has been awarded the Mahe Femer Fellowship in 2022. As a member of the Department of Medical Education at her home institute, she is actively involved in all activities undertaken by the ME department. She is also resource faculty for the NMC basic courses in medical education workshop at KGMU NMC Nodal Center. She is coordinator, co-coordinator and a resource faculty for masters in health professions education course at KGMU. She is life member of Medical Pharmacology Society, the Association of Physiology and Pharmacology. National Association of Pharmacology and Therapeutics and Pharmacological so Society. Problem is that it is bad. It is very loose. Shoot, shoot, shoot. Look, shoot, shoot. It is bad. 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 It is bad.
most recent is conducting workshop on self directing learning self directed learning at nchpe 2022 jolly grant symposium on rent advance on recent advances in drug development discovery at epicon 2022 and webinar on role of artificial intelligence in the development for app appi gujarat state chapter 2023 she was part of training faculty aims gorakhpur in medical education in april 2023 she has also been part of organizing team for various national conferences and areas of interest include clinical pharmacology diabetes medicine and medical education board member editorial board member of national journal of pharmacology and therapeutics uh, publication house walter he has authored three books related to pharmacology and medical education which are running well uh, so these are the three books with these words i would like to invite dr uh, shujok sindhu to deliver her talk please unmute ma'am please make Hello. it very uh, warm namaskar yeah. Ah, yeah thank you a very warm namaskar to one and all present after being enlightened by dr somnath basu sir uh, i continue the conference with my session on protocol components and clinical trial design before that i thank uh, dr chenmay sir for giving uh, such a nice introduction thank you sir so continuing with the session the learning objective of this session is at the end of this session the audience shall be able to describe components of a protocol while designing a clinical trial so first question is what is a protocol it's it is what enhances transparency in randomized trials pre specifies the methods used in the trial reduces the likelihood of undeclared post hoc changes to the trial for example the outcome switching which is not allowed so we need to have a protocol before starting with the clinical trial and it is to be based on evidence based guidelines like we follow spirit guidelines which stands for standard protocol items recommendations for interventional trials statement which was published in 2013 this is what the spirit guidelines uh, look like it can be downloaded from the website so what is a clinical trial protocol it's a document that describes background and rationale of clinical trial the research questions objectives design methodology statistical considerations ethical considerations aspects related to the organization conducting the clinical trial and these are to be in lines with guidelines given like ich and icmr guidelines so first aspect to be covered in protocol is the background information or the significance of the study which includes name and description of the investigational product for retrospective reviews justification of the charts and medical records used summary of results from prior clinical studies and clinical data uh, till date human subjects risk and benefits description of the population to be studied description and justification for the dosing regimen and treatment uh, period statement of compliance with the protocol sops and the uh, any federal state or local regulations which are to be followed then citations and data relevant to the trial is to be mentioned the next aspect is objectives rationale and the research question a detailed description of the primary and secondary objectives is to be given the purpose of the study is to be mentioned research hypothesis or the research question and then discuss the project feasibility details of resources skills and experience of the investigators required to complete the study and then the details of any pilot study if done is are required then we have to mention the clinical study design that is being used for the study which includes the primary and secondary endpoints information pertaining to the research question the study design uh, which one is to be used like it is single or double blinded observational randomized retrospective or real time it is to be clearly mentioned in the protocol in the dose dosing regimen of the drug packaging labeling of the experimental drug all is to be mentioned how the drug will be stored and dispensed to the participants has to be mentioned the expected duration of the study and the subjects participation is to be mentioned a schematic diagram like in a flow chart is always welcome it's more impressive 
while being uh, submitted for a review. There should be description of sequence and duration of all study periods, uh, description of follow-up visits if any is required, conditions when subjects' participation in the trial may be discontinued, maintenance of randomization codes and confidentiality. This is very important. Uh, then potential risk and steps taken to minimize the risk and the possible benefits of the study. The subject inclusion and exclusion criteria, criteria are to be mentioned clearly. Enrollment of persons of diverse racial and ethnic backgrounds is always welcome. And it is encouraged because this ensures that the benefits of the research study are distributed in, in an equitable manner. Informed consent form has to be taken and the process, how will it be taken, is important once again. Information about the regulatory requirements of the consent form has to be mentioned. The languages in which the form will be given is to be mentioned. Discussion on additional safeguards taken if potentially vulnerable subjects will be enrolled in the study. Like if we are including children, prisoners, or pregnant females, or cognitively impaired or critically ill subjects, then how we shall safeguard uh, them, that is to be mentioned in the protocol itself. We have to specify the codes of ethics under which the consent will be obtained. And we should include a copy of the proposed informed consent form along with the protocol. And the codes of ethics uh, include, like it can be like at either the Belmont Report or the Declaration of Helsinki or American Psychological Association or ICMR guidelines, anything. So we have to mention on what guidelines we are following to make our informed consent. How we should report the adverse event if it occurs, that is to be mentioned in the protocol. So we will describe a plan to report any adverse event. Anticipated adverse events should be clearly documented. Identify the type and duration of follow-up and treatment for subjects that experience an adverse event. We need to assess the safety and efficacy, and that is to be mentioned in the protocol. We have to specify about the efficacy parameters the methods and timings for assessing, recording, and analyzing the efficacy parameters is to be mentioned. We have to specify the safety parameters, record and report properly all the adverse events and intercurrent all this will be done has to be mentioned in the protocol. This to be remembered in Indian scenario, the principal investigator has to report any serious adverse event within 24 hours of occurrence to the licensing authority as DCGI to the chairperson of the ethics committee. This has to be done, otherwise it becomes a legal issue. And then this report is furthered by a detailed report by both the investigator and the EC and given to DCGI, who then gives a final decision on the amount of compensation to be given by the sponsor or the sponsor's representative to the grieving party. Treatment of subjects, all the treatments to be administered, including the product's name, dose, route of administration, and treatment period for subjects has to be mentioned in the protocol. All medications permitted to the participants before and during the clinical trial have to be clearly mentioned. Procedures for monitoring subjects' compliance are to be mentioned. How the data will be collected, that plan has to be mentioned in the protocol. Define the type of data collection instrument that will be used and list all the variables. Specify if computerized databases will be used. Identify which software will be used. Explain precautionary steps taken to secure the data, again, for the sake of confidentiality. Data assets. So inform who will have the access to the data and how the data will be used. If data with subject identifies will be released, then we have to specify the person or agency to whom the information will be released and the purpose for the release. Address all study-related monitoring, audits, and regulatory inspections. We have to describe the statistical methods in details, the number of subjects to be enrolled. In case of multi-center studies, we have to include the total number of sites expected and the total number of subjects to be enrolled across all sites. The rationale for sample size, calculations on the power of the trial, and the clinical justification all need to be mentioned. Procedure of accounting for missing, unused, or spurious data has to be mentioned. Procedures for reporting deviations from the original statistical plan and the selection of subjects to be included in the analysis. All this has to be mentioned. We have to uh, document clearly any financial or other competing interests for principal investigators or the co-investigators for the overall trial and for each study site in case of multi-site multi, uh, trials, multi-site trials. 
we have to list any meetings or conferences that will be the way this data will be presented and the results will be presented. So we have to mention this beforehand, the protocol where we shall present the data of the study. The timeline, we have to have a Gantt chart stating when we plan to start and complete the study, including a description of this timeline. For example, when the subjects will be enrolled, where we it is within a month, when the data will be collected, maybe within six months, that's way we have to give a full description how the study will go ahead. We have to list all the references using the background section at the end of the protocol. So now the question is, why is the clinical trial uh, protocol needed? Because it's a key quality control tool for all aspects of a clinical trial. It ensures the health and safety of, of all the study participants, provides a precise study plan, defines and manages the trial, and therefore it should be strictly followed by all the study investigators. It guarantees the integrity of data, allowing the combination and comparison of data across all investigators and study sites. Uh, it is required to obtain ethical approval from a research ethics committee or an IRB. So uh, this, that's the end of my session. And the take home message from my side is follow protocol contain guidelines and address all items included in the guidelines. Mention all relevant preclinical and clinical data, including published and unpublished data in the background section. All research related activities should be detailed in the protocol and the consent form. Describe in detail all study activities that participants will undergo. So that's all from my side. Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, so if any yeah. question is there. So I would like to thank uh, Dr. Suyok Sindhu for you know making a nice presentation uh, it's really good and uh, thank you for like uh, very to, much for your contribution so i would like to thank uh, you yourself uh, dr shivanan and also the, all the organizers for giving me this opportunity today thank you so much Man, designing the protocol it is very difficult <laughs> in clinical definitely. <laughs> definitely so the first and most uh, difficult yes. hurdle that we have to cross yes yes so moving next uh, moving to our next speaker just a minute we have uh, dr gayatri biswakarma with us she is uh, she is currently uh, working as a lead biostatistician at uh, george institute of Institute for Global Health India. She has uh, done her uh, MSc and PhD in statistics and MBA in quality management. Then uh, postdoc from uh, CCHSA, University of uh, Saskatchewan, Canada. More than 50 publications uh, she has in, to her credit and uh, including one book chapter. The visiting scientist at the UT Health uh, Science Center Tyler, uh, USA. She is the elected member of International Statistical Institute, Netherlands, and Committee of Women in Statistics (ISI), an Ethics Committee, and uh, SRC member of GG, SIPU, DD, UH, CCRS, and uh, NICPR, and uh, Jami Ahmad. She is the associate editor of the Journal of Clinical Orthopedics, and it and frontiers in pain research area of her area of interest are like clinical trials epidemiological studies systematic review and meta-analysis and research methodology with uh, these words i would like to invite dr uh, dr Vishwakarma to deliver her talk Stop thank you so much thank you dr chinma and i would like to thank dr shiva murthy and because we have been seeing him uh, working you people are working since last one uh, month continuously day and night every time we are getting messages like <laughs> uh, uh, it's really really wonderful to see that working like this every time you have to remind thank us you. beside that <laughs> we are not responding that <laughs> yeah it's really really very nice so thank you so much and congratulations on this. Uh, I'm sharing my screen now. You can put it in full screen mode. Okay, right? sure. Yeah. 
Um, yes. So this is in continuation with the Dr. CEO talk um, on protocol, like what all the things uh, has to be mentioned. So I'm taking a little bit inside of that, like what exactly you have to write about the sample size, then data capturing, uh, case report form, randomization, blinding, and clinical data management. So what everybody is talking about the guidelines, like what I know, as I have mentioned, there are several gu guidelines in this um, um, world, I can say, the globally. But what I learned, I learned only the two uh, guidelines. That is one is ICMR, G uh, CDSO, GCP guideline, and another is ICH guideline. So ICH guideline, they have different sectors. And what I am focusing on, that is E9, which is based on the statistical principle for uh, clinical trials. So if you see this picture, so I'm going to talk about the role of biostatistician. What I understood after doing so many um, uh, clinical uh, GCP trainings, what I got to know that this is all about because this is, you know, you, you can't do this uh, GCP uh, or clinical trial alone. It's a teamwork. And the GCP guideline, what it says, that everybody has to understand their own responsibility. Uh, investigators have their own responsibility. Monitors have their own responsibility. You know, similarly, the biostatistician have their own responsibility because uh, as a part of clinical trial. So as you can see in this picture, what you can see, the statistician is saying that I can prove or dis the, disprove it. So this is not the case in clinical trial and that's how these clinical uh, guidelines, trial guidelines has been developed so that this cannot be the case. This, this should be, uh, not be the case. So another myth is there, uh, which is now after, uh, this kind of uh, workshop people are conducting, it is um, eliminating uh, from many of the mind, but still people think that role of biostatistician comes when we have the data and for the data analysis, which is not right. So that's how I'm quoting some of the uh, important points where the biostatistician, so it is starting from the protocol development to the uh, writing the final report. So the first, starting from the protocol development. So in the protocol development, the most important thing comes up the sample size calculation. Because when we think of, even when research question comes in our mind, first thing we have to look for, okay, feasibility. How many subjects should I need for the, uh, this uh, trial, right? So after, uh, without knowing that, you cannot go beyond this. The second thing is whether I have to randomize the subjects or not, what method we have to use. It's not just only randomization, like you can call the subjects on the Monday, Wednesday, and Thursday, for those who are getting treatment and rest will come on the other day. So a specific probability methods are there, which you have to use, and that also depend on your study design, uh, your objectives. So based on that, you have to uh, find out one specific method which you have to mention for generating randomization schedule and blinding. Then the next part comes on uh, data collection and management. So in data collection and management, uh, uh, biostatistician collaborates with the data managers to ensure the data are collected accurately and consistently according to the study protocol. Then a statistical analysis plan is the main thing which where a statistic a statistician role comes in. They have to prepare this statistical analysis plan beforehand with the help of a uh, uh, trial team. Then data safety and monitoring board, monitoring uh, what is the uh, role of uh, biostatistician. In the data monitoring, uh, there is one role of biostatistician, specifically if you have, have heard about the DC, DSMC or DSMB, Data Safety Monitoring Board. So one independent biostatistician review the data by analyzing it. That is very important part. Then 
this is the most important thing everybody knows that what is the statistician role uh, in doing a statistical analysis and then the regulate regulatory submission so in regulatory submission what is the biostatistician role they have to prepare the clinical study report which is known as csr and integrate summary of safety as well as efficacy separately so that is very important part of the clinical trial after uh, conduct of um, completion of this study then adherence to the gcp guidelines how like this is this can go to the everyone role or whosoever is there but biostatistician also responsible for this so that they adhere to the gcp guidelines and they ensure that all statistical procedures or analysis whatever is mentioned in the sap they adhere to the gcp principle and last collaboration and communicate yes definitely we collaborate with all the different teams with the data management with the uh, site management with the investigators and finally we write the manuscript and article or uh, the thesis whatever we want to say and then we communicate now let's start the few topics which i have the sample size data management uh, randomization and blinding so why it is important so what we say why sample size is important it is important because of the three ways so first important point is ethical sample size because what will what is going to happen you cannot have the over uh, size study you cannot have the under size study what happen if you have under size study that means small size is smaller whatever is required to you can expose subjects to unnecessary harmful treatment without the capability of advancing the knowledge similarly if you have over size study that has potential to expose an unnecessarily large number of subjects to potential harmful for the treatment the second reason why sample size is important is the scientific reason why scientific reason if let's say if the trial has a negative result most of the time it can come because we don't know the reality what is going to happen and trial has ended up with the negative result what we have expected it has not come with a sufficient sample size it is really important to quote this and it is really important to publish it but if a trial with the negative result has insufficient power because of the small sample size and clinically important difference is not met that means we are ignoring the evidences and um, which is scientifically not correct nobody will accept your results the third and final reason uh, why sample size is important for the economic because you have to assess the feasibility before conducting your clinical trial okay so if you have the small sample size study you are wasting resources due to their incapability of yielding useful results and if you have oversized then unnecessary waste of resources so ultimately what i want to say we have to have optimum number of patients based on that whatever you are getting an optimum number of power of the study and then whatever results you are presenting that will be accepted by the scientific committee whether you are getting negative results or you are getting the positive results so why sample size is important to minimize the risk of making the wrong decision wrong wrong conclusions from your study also it helps to plan your study needs because if you know beforehand that okay i need 100 subjects or 200 subjects you can arrange the other thing drugs or medical devices or follow ups whatever you want to say so budget is very very important and it also helps to determine if a study is feasible now in sample size determination you have to be very careful that you have to mention these four points one thing is, is estimation why i am writing estimation i am not writing calculation because this is basically sample size is the estimation this is a guesstimation you can say based on the previous studies or published studies or the pilot study which we give so you have to mention the calculation part that how you have calculated then you have to write the justification about it why you have calculated this and why you have got this justification means to reach to this particular power minimum is 80% power you have to reach and then you have to write about the adjustment if you are making in your study like covariates dropout rates and then you have to write 
specifically if you want to do some re-estimation in between the trial, for example, after interim analysis, maybe you are not getting some uh, different patient and then you have to mention beforehand in the protocol that based on this particular condition, if you are, we are not getting sufficient subjects in any of the trial arms, then we may recalculate it. And that is also known as adaptive clinical trial that the study design is totally different. So sample size calculation can be done in two ways. One is patient I need approach and another is patient I get. Generally in clinical trial, what we do, patient I need, how many patient I need to conduct this clinical trial, 90% of the time or 95% of the time we use this approach, which is based on the calculation of the sample size for a given power, level of significance and clinically meaningful important difference. And patient I can get, let, that, let's, let's say you already have the patient, which is not the case of clinical trial, which is based on the calculation of the power. Here we are calculating power based on whatever sample we have. Now, I would like to uh, tell you one very interesting publication, which I really admire a lot and want to work on this. The title of the article is The P-Value You Can't Buy It. This is published in American Statistician in 2016, which talks about the D-value other than P-value. Why? P-value, because P-value tells you up, like it is uh, the calculation. Calculation is based on the, uh, you know, group uh, comparison, while the D-value is, is the individual comparison. So they, they have uh, nicely mentioned this, that group comparison is between the two, two treatments are statistically significant, but we calculate the D value and uh, it is not coming. So basically they want to say that if you have large number of subjects, let's say you are doing for more than 10,000 subjects, statistical uh, significance can be achieved easily. Now let's move to the another topic, very important randomization, which is the process of allocating study participants randomly to different arms. Why it is important to understand? Because it helps eliminating the selection bias. It ensures that the potential confounding factors are evenly distributed among the groups and obviously the statistical validity. The second thing is the blinding. So blinding is also sometimes people say the masking. This is a technique which is used to minimize bias that may occur during the conduct of the trial. So the, what is the purpose of doing the blinding? To minimize the bias, basically what is the, what bias we can have? One is measurement bias, another is selection bias. So basically selection bias, we are reducing by doing the randomization. And here we are uh, doing some other kind of bias like assessment bias, uh, uh, outcome assessor has to be different. So different kind of blindings are also there, which you have to mention beforehand in your protocol that what kind of blinding you are going to apply in your clinical trial. That guidelines is specifically mentioned there. And objectivity, that is very important part of the um, clinical trial. And it also helps to maintain the integrity of the study design. So there are various types of blinding. I'm just going to explain through this um, picture, the single blinded study. So there we have generally in clinical trial, I segregated in three parts as a statistician, you know, we have participants, we have researchers, we have data analysts. Researcher means those who are assessing the outcome. So if we are blinded, uh, if we are uh, uh, just participants are blinded in the study, it is known as single blinded study. While in the double blinded study, where participant as well as researcher, so you can say investigator or the outcome assessor who is uh, going to assess the patient after giving intervention, both are blinded. It is known as double blinded study. And the triple blinded study where all three are blinded. That means participants doesn't know what they, what they are going to get, whether it is a treatment or placebo, similarly with the researcher as well as with the data analysis. So there are a role of there uh, generally in the blindness study, uh, the guideline has given name of the statistician so that you can identify if somebody is saying trial statistician, trial statistician will not have access, the, the trial statistician will be blinded for, from this data. Okay, so in the guideline, uh, uh, names are given for the statistician and those who will be the unblinded statistician, those who can see which group has given, that has to be independent biostatistician from the different institute. 
So uh, one name is independent statistician, another is trial statistician. So here data analyst will be the trial statistician for the triple blind or double blind study, sometimes people blind. Now, the heart of the data analysis or anything you can say, if data management is not done properly, you are not going to get your valid result. Even a statistician can't help. So the important part of this um, uh, guideline, which is uh, telling you about the data management because it is designed to deliver the error-free and validated statistically sound databases. So what you have to do? So you can understand from this circle, process that you are uh, defining your research, then you have to design the informed consent, then designing the CRF. So these are the starting from the informed consent, how you have to write where, what information you have to collect in there, because that has to be confidential, you are, whether you are asking your phone number, email, name, and other things. So that, that is a part of data management, because informed consent, whether a subject has given the informed uh, consent or not, that has to be recorded in the data. Then only you can take the data for the analysis. Then CRF design, that means case report form. Then coding of this data, then data entry, data cleaning, data analysis. So this is the process of the data management which has to be done in a proper format. And it is mentioned in E-line guidelines that what you have to do in the clinical data management tool. It has to be at par with the 21 CFR part 11, that is code for federal regulation. They are talking about the electronic records and electronic signature. They also talk about to ensure the authenticity, integrity and reliability of the electronic records and signature that is used in various industries, including pharmaceuticals, biotechnology, medical devices and food industry. They also talk about the audit trails, record retention, security measures, electronic signature controls, even record copies and backup for how long you have to keep this backup after completing the study, even after publishing. So these guidelines are given there, which you need to take care beforehand at the time of developing protocol that what tool you are going to manage. The number of tools are there, um, uh, which, uh, which is available uh, based on this uh, code of federal regulations. Now, this also very important that what kind of data you are collecting. That means data is different. Like one thing is whether you are going to collect on the paper based. So PDC means paper based data capturing or electronic based data capturing. EDC means electronic based data capturing. So as you can see from this um, um, flow chart, that what are the processes? And that has to be predefined that you have to um, what measures you are going to take because you know there are pros and cons of both um, because electronic data capturing that means you have some tabs you are giving and that is connected to the server there has to be uh, connectivity internet availability is there but that is very important and nowadays everybody is using EDC only because query resol resolution is the uh, uh, is very uh, quick here and it can be sent easily to to, to the manager resolution to the PI and database can be logged. So there are some tools I have mentioned that Oracle, Clinica, Clinical Trial, RedCap, CS Pro, Open Clinica, MySQL, you can choose any one of them according to um, your budget and then you can. Then data quality, the missing values and visits. So this is also important from the uh, clinical trial perspective because if you have some missing data patterns or missing visits, how you are going to um, justify that or what are, if you are going to have some imputation, how you're going to manage. So each and everything has to be written beforehand. And this uh, method is also given in the E-line guidelines that how to manage the missing values. Though it depends on your study statistical method, which you are going to use. You have to be very careful about the outliers and data. Uh, which uh, which you can expect from the outside range. You cannot directly say because this is going beyond my range. I have to. I will remove the subjects. No. And once the subject is enrolled and randomized, you cannot take the decision whether we have to remove it or not. So how you are going to manage? What all processes you are going to take to resolve this query? Whether it is a typo mistake or whatever, or you have to redo this test. 
all these things you have to mention beforehand. Kindly, then duplicates. Kindly yeah, mind. I'm going to mention. Oh, mobile, oh, mobile. So duplicates, protocol violations, data entry, data errors, and data discrepancies. Okay. So data collection is the important part of the data analysis. Ma. It starts from the screening, baseline, intervention, and follow-up. Sorry to interrupt so as you. you can see. Uh, Ma'am, I'm muting all because there is some background news. So kindly unmute yourself while you are speaking. Ma okay, sure. Thank you. Thank you. So at the time of screening, you have to make sure that what is the inclusion exclusion criteria that has to go in your uh, database management program, then baseline, then intervention, what details, compliance is the important thing. I'm, I have been uh, doing the analysis and uh, 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 this is like definition has to be exactly written that what, how you will say that the subject is compliance to this particular thing if they are taking some doses, it's 50% of the doses they have taken, then we will say the compliance or 80% of the doses that you have to mention and then follow up, which is the important part for the adverse event and safety point of view. So this is the take home message. The sample size calculation has to be based on the primary endpoints, effective uh, expected effect size, desirable statistical power and significance level. You have to ensure the study's ability to detect the cl clinically meaningful difference, which is also known as MCID, uh, and then draw your valid conclusion. Similarly, for the randomization, I'm again emphasizing you have to mention the specific technique. You cannot just only write that it will be done through the computer allocation. You have to mention a specific method, how and who will carry this randomization, because if it is a blinded trial, Investigator cannot have the randomization list. So that also one proper documentation on randomization blinding has to be prepared, how it will be done. And the data management, data management plan and statistical analysis plan has to be written in well in advance in a collaboration with the trial team and CRF designing to ensure the reliability and validity of the results and protect the rights and safety of the study participant. With this note, I would like to thank you everyone for listening to me patiently. Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am, uh, for a very nice presentation. So, and I also would like to, you know, thank you. Yeah. I also yeah. would like to thank uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Gayatri. Uh, excellent job. and. Uh, Oh, no, excellent way of cooperation uh, we received. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, sir. And uh, Dr. Gayatri, we have two questions. I sent one question to your uh, WhatsApp. Play. Can you please uh, check it? Okay. Sir, we'll take the questions later. Can we take, sir? Uh, yeah, let us just see if okay, she can answer start, yeah. in one minute. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, the question is, should we use 95% confidence interval or uh, SD when uh, projecting least square means and least square treatment difference? What is correct scientifically and how the statistician interpret the approach? Always, I will suggest you have to present the 95% confidence interval because it gives the lower boundary and the upper boundary, while standard deviation is one point uh, measure. So standard deviation is uh, related to the descriptive part, while 95% confidence interval is related to interpretation part. So it is uh, like 95% confidence interval. Okay, thank you so much. We'll take the other questions later because of the sure. paucity of time. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, now moving to our next speaker, Mr. Anirudh Sahu. He is currently working as senior project manager at uh, George Clinical. He's a registered pharmacist and uh, uh, he's uh, got 16 plus years of experience in clinical research and regulatory efforts operation and project management and ethics committee. He has got exposed to end-to-end -end clinical studies, phase one to four, presented to SEC India, FDA, DSMB, and CAB, served as uh, ethics committee secretary and worked in pharmaceutical biotechnology companies and CROs. Uh, in depth understanding, he's having depth understanding clinical regulatory and product registration and uh, previous companies are uh, where he has worked like 
biologics, myelin mm -hmm. laboratories, Dr. Reddy's laboratories, and Sun Pharma. With this, sir, I would like to invite you to deliver your talk. Uh, platform is yours now. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Chinmay, for this, my presentation. And I'll try to take the screen to show you. Sir, as we are running out of time, sir, kindly. I will make it very crisp, no problem. I'm just trying to make it full screen. Uh, mm, yes. Come. Hope my screen is full now, everybody. Yes, sir. Okay, so in the interest of time, I'll not take so much of time for the DCGI organized organograms and other features of the DCGI. So I'll skip those slides because uh, it was being well explained by the our CDSU colleague and other colleagues. So these are like you know CDSU as a governing body and uh, there are the state FDA, every state we have also one office. So they have the various roles in terms of our clinical trial conducts and all. So I just want to come to the, you know, the clinical trial applications, particularly what are the notes uh, with special interest to the India if you are filing any clinical trial application irrespective of the phases. So key fact is that India is always a good country in terms of that they are they're accepting uh, English language of the applications, which is versatile in nature. And that's the one of the major attraction of India to become a clinical trial hub because there is no barrier of the, uh, you know, language, particularly the English. And also one key factor is that you can submit your application uh, to regulatory authority as well as the ethics committee review. At the same time, we'll have to weigh your applications, how your protocol is well composed and how you are thinking that zero risk or less risk for getting the approvals in that angle, you can uh, make your ethics committee submission because these all are uh, time and effort, uh, both are involved in the ethics committee submissions. Uh, another thing is that clinical trial registration is required. Yes, we have a clinical trial registry of India. You can register your trials. If your application is investigational new drug for the FDA, US FDA submissions and EMA, then you may need to go for the clinicaltrial.gov also, but still you need to submit your application in the CTRI. Country in country sponsor presence. If you are the sponsor and you are suppose you are in Japan, you would like to conduct your study in India. So you should have a sponsor representative here. In terms of you can take a CRO or you can have uh, your uh, distribution agencies. You should have a legal entity here in terms of that sponsor presence. <coughs> Any kind of bioanalytical samples to be analyzed, specimens, export, yes, it is allowed. You can send to various laboratories, to the Singapore, to US, to Europe, or any part of the world in the uh, outside of the India for the test and analysis for the bioanalytical testings. Various regulatory fee I have kept here, so you can refer later on. Coming to the submission and review. So there are types of submissions you will find, investigational new drug, new drug clinical trials, global clinical trials, and post-marketing studies. And the reviews are twofold studies. Uh, reviews are being done here. One, the DCGI office, there are, a, uh, you know, office members are there. So they used to review your entire dossier, what is being submitted through online portal, it is SUGAM. And also this is being evaluated by the subject expert committee for particularly in the protocol and the CSRs. So that need to be presented in front of subject expert committee, your protocol, and also the CSR. Coming to the clinical trial life cycle efficacy, then there are submission process, there are timeline for the review, there are query or approval, and again, there are the response and the study conduct. So this is the crisp of a clinical trial life. 
key documents for the clinical trial prospect, study documents, as you are aware of that, various study documents are required, letters, various letters are required. Within the letters, you have to send two affidavit documents, which is must be notarized. And for the site document, you should have the investigator undertaking CVMRC GCP certificates. Apart from that, if you are submitting your application to IND in FDA, then you must collect form 1572 and financial disclosure form. Why I have highlighted these things many times, our team forgets this one and they are only collecting IU and later on again, they are collecting the 1572. So we need to be very clear about the, our application. And also the recent advancement is that the DCGI wants the laboratory contact person and email ID. So that is very important to collect those information because this is one of the mandatory field in the SUGAM portal when they are uploading the applications. It may happen, so you are providing all the documents and you have forgot to this, then might be the chances that the day when our regulatory colleague will submit in that time, you may not to be, you may to be hurry for that, you know, have to collect those information. Okay. And also there is a financial agreement in draft condition also you can submit. Overall city application process, you'll have to submit to the CDSO. CDSO will propose this one with their review to SEC and then SEC will submit their recommendation after the presentations and this fed feedback will be given to the sponsor. Yes, no or query and then applicant must to submit the written reply or they need to be due for the re-presentation in terms of the re-deliberation, I can say. And then DCGI may give you the permission or again, the rejection happens. Mind it, when your application will be reject, you'll have to pay full amount of the application fee in the next time. So we'll have to be very clear about our protocol and processes. So this I am skipping in the interest of time for the di diagrammatic presentation for SEC review process. So this is nothing but what I have explained. And the key point for the SEC protocol presentation, yes, as I am the presenter for the FDA and all. So what I have understood in our protocol presentation, we should have the well composed protocol as our colleagues have explained about the protocol and sample size is a very important points, which is justifying the sample size estimation rather than the calculation. So rationality, it should be why this drug, why this is this drug is important for India, why this drug is important for the world. What is the alternative? If I have the alternative, if I have no more side effects, why you are coming to another drug? Again, the benefit versus risk. What are the benefit, additional benefit my patient is going to take, get with your drug? Whether is there are more adverse events, whether you have calculated those adverse events. So these are the questions are very common in the SEC presentations and FDA presentations. So we'll have to be very clear data with the information for these type of questions. Coming to the sample size justification, as I have told, and the output is also required for that. Sometimes they, are, they want to see how you have calculated, how you have estimated your sample size. So that output should be ready not in the particular presentation, but in the backend slides. Well-defined objectives and endpoints. Many times people are making the mistake of the same thing. They are writing two times the objective and endpoints. We need to be extra careful for that. And of course, the distribution of the sites should be geographically distributed sites, mixed of the government and private. And toxicity data is must. Overall documents required for the phase three trial, I have a snapshot of my recent applications. So where uh, we are submitting like what are the documents are required for phase three. I have kept some scanner here like that. These are the things are very important, which are the recent advancement has been happened. Like details about the central lab. I have mentioned this one lab detail information, including the email ID and the phone number. If it fits, undertaking of the sponsor for the marketing authorization, because if you are submitting any global study, then there may not be the chance that you are not going to market the product in India. So in that condition, you will not going to get the approval. Second thing, name and address of the laboratory and then therapeutic exploratory trial phase two data. Yes, for biosimilar application, if you are doing, then phase two data is not required. You can do parallel study for the phase one and phase three. Yeah, this is up to your regulatory uh, colleagues, how they are justifying. 
But yes, there are the provision that you can do the parallel study of phase one and directly to the phase three for the many biosimilar applications. Overall, these are the insurance certificate is very important undertaking of the investigator. I have mentioned this one. So this is in nutshell about the documents required. Those are for the clinical trial applications and this is the processes. Overall import licenses, cover letter, justification of quantity of IP, name and address, subcontact number and email ID of the vendor, company, name and address contract or an email ID of manufacturing site and manufacturers. So this is in nutshell about the clinical trial application processes for the with a special interest for the CDSU. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. I hope I have not taken much time to you. Yes, yes sir. Yes. Sir. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, if any question is there, we can take or uh, I would like to, you know, I would like to thank uh, uh, Anirudh. Uh, excellent thank presentation. You. Uh, so it's a great association. Looking forward for more. Thank you so much. Thank you. Now moving towards our uh, next speaker, Dr. Uh, Sapna Patil. She is currently working as associate professor at the Department of Pharmacology, Saptogri Institute of Medical Science and Research Center, Bangalore, Karnataka. She has completed her MD Pharmacology and from Sri Devraj URS Medical College, Polar, and she also completed the MLE. Uh, other courses completed at CC. BDM and PDCA, CCTV, good clinical practice, all. And uh, she is having more than 18 years of teaching experience and also worked as clinic pharmacologist at uh, Apollo Hospital, Karnataka Division. She is currently working as associate professor at uh, Saptagiri Institute of uh, Medical Science and Research Center, Bangalore. Her main area of interest is teaching research and pharmacology. She is she has participated in many international and national conferences, CMEs, and workshops. She has presented papers at various conferences, including international conferences at Malaysia. Uh, she has uh, six publications in both international and national journals and currently working on three projects. She has life memberships in, in uh, former professional bodies, including IPS, APPI, MPS, and uh, she is a reviewer for journal journals like the national and international journals and uh, she has participated as a person and joined competition in pharmacology conferences she uh, she is also certified instructor for cls program with these words i would like to uh, invite her to deliver her talk yes yes please. thank you sir thank you dr chinman for your kind introduction am i audible Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I'll just share my slides. Yes. And kind request to finish it uh, as soon as possible. Yes, sir. Yes. So just a minute. Hello, Dr. Sapna. Dr. Sapna? Not able to hear you. Yeah. I think she is on mute. I'm not able to hear her. Not audible. Am I audible Am I now? Audible? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So I would like to uh, thank Dr. Shumurti sir and uh, the organizing team for having given me this opportunity to give my talk here. So uh, before uh, I go to the presentation, so I'm not able to change the slides. 
Ma'am, kindly click on the slide and there you will find. Click on it, ma'am. Which one? Ma'am, just uh, randomly click on the slide. Anywhere. Randomly yeah. just click, click, click. Yes. And yes. Uh, at the bottom, you will find uh, arrow options. Hopefully. Yes. Um, yes. yes. Thank, Thank you. you. It is so focusing. Just, uh, yes, sir. So, just a brief introduction before I go to my proper topic. So the progress of medical knowledge and therapeutic medicine, it is quite impossible without research in medicine. So this kind of clinical research is mainly designed to improve the overall human health. And this leads to significant advances in the scientific knowledge. But as we all know, a host of legal issues arise during the conduct of clinical research itself. But law itself demands the conduct of clinical research before any new drug is introduced into the market. So why are these regulations and code of ethics important in clinical research? So as we've been hearing about some of the unfortunate cases of unethical research which have been conducted. So the, one of the most well-known cases is that of the Tuskegee syphilis study. So as already been discussed by Dr. Chinmay and the other uh, speakers. So this was one of the most uh, unfortunate and unethical research which has been conducted. So where uh, the patients or uh, sorry, the patients or the subjects who were recruited did not have the right to withdraw from the study. And uh, also they were not uh, asked for any kind of informed consent. And the investigators were mainly uh, bothered only about the progress of the disease. So even though treatment was available, it was not given to the subjects. So it is always difficult to make a clear distinction between treatment and research. So regarding the regulation of clinical research, what are the international and uh, uh, clinical guidelines for conduct of clinical research in India, this has already been dealt with. So I will just go to the topic proper, which is principles of ethics in clinical research. So first and foremost is value or social value. So before starting any kind of clinical trial, a research question has to have any kind of value, whether it is socially, scientifically, or clinically relevant. Next, validity. So the proposed study should have strategy and feasibility and any kind of acceptable scientific design, statistical methodology and implementation. So one of the uh, examples I would like to give here is in 1990, post-exposure prophylaxis for uh, HIV, uh, it was introduced, but there was no uh, you know, uh, randomized uh, controlled trials which were conducted. And all the uh, healthcare professionals, they only, uh, they only relied on uh, data which were uh, given from the, taken from the case reports. Next is subject selection. It has to be fair. It, it is needed mainly to minimize the risk with the people who are selected. And of course, special attention should be paid to vulnerable and high risk subjects. And there should always be evidence of unbiased selection of these subjects. Next is the risk benefit. Uh, the subject should be informed and they have to comprehend the associated risks or benefits, whatever is uh, the outcome uh, and uh, whatever is the risk which will be involved in the clinical study. So independent review. So while this is a procedural requirement, it is one that has other benefits such as public accountability. And it is one of the ways to check both the enthusiasm and potential conflict on the part of the investigators. Next principle is of course informed consent. So it is nothing but the subject's ability to make their own decision whether uh, they can, they need to participate or they want to participate and the informed consent process must be reviewed by the ethics committee. Also appropriate information should be provided to the, uh, all the subjects regarding the risks and the benefits involved in the study. Next is respect for the enrolled participants. So this mainly involves monitoring well-being of the individuals who are participating in the study. And we have to protect their confidentiality. 
okay and making relevant information available and also they have as i just said right to withdraw from the study if they want to at any particular given point of time so this was not there as we have seen in this tasji study confidentiality and privacy of the subjects has to be maintained next compensation provided to the subjects for participation so this has to be paid to the subjects as per the informed consent document the contract whatever is available and applicable rules and regulations but again this compensation amount has to be approved by the ethics committee next one important uh, uh, you know principle which is involved in uh, clinical research is reporting of serious adverse events so this must be addressed so sae reporting timelines and compensation should be as per the regulation and compensation for injury or injured patients also has to be approved by the ethics committee protection of subject rights safety and well being so for this the subject grievance redressal process has to be there also adequate finance human resource allocation for administrative work and record keeping must be there so what i mean by this is finance financial transparency of functioning of the ethics committee should be there proposals involving special population such as pregnant mothers children and vulnerable subjects should be evaluated as per rules and regulations conflict of interest policy also should be uh, you know declared prior to the review security confidentiality and integrity of all the documents should also be present and all these documents and whatever records are there should be archived after trial completion or termination as per the applicable rules and regulations next very important autonomy principle of autonomy so the patient or the subject has the freedom of thought intention and action so he should understand all the risks and benefits of the procedure and likelihood likelihood of success if at all he participates in the study next is beneficence so the practitioner or the investigator should always act in the best interest of the patient so there should be an intention of doing only good to the patient and also non maleficence that means we should not do any harm to the patient so the trial or the procedure should not harm the patient or any other person in the society so this is a table which shows or summarizes all these principles so respect for autonomy that means information about the risks and benefits should be provided to the study participants beneficence we should always act best in the best interest of the patient non maleficence do no harm conflict of interest policy as i said should be present very important informed consent so the study participant should have the ability to make their own decisions and also they should have the right to withdraw from the study at any particular given point of time confidentiality is another very important principle which has to be maintained throughout the study and of course uh, last but not the least serious adverse events must be addressed next uh, we'll i'll be discussing about the composition of ethics committee so composition first of all should be multidisciplinary secondly multi sectoral and adequate for its functioning so any ethics committee should include at least five of these members first a lay person basic medical scientist chair person clinician legal expert or retired judge social scientist or representative from non government voluntary agency member secretary and philosopher or ethicist or theologian so uh, briefly about what is quorum and what it means it is nothing but the count of number of members present in the ec meeting and if the number present falls below the required number the quorum fails if any member Uh, is absent again requirement of the quorum will not be met if an investigator is part of the quorum of five members and if he or she is unable to vote for his or her own study again the quorum shall fail now what are the uh, recent uh, advance uh, recent challenges due to technology advancement so mainly 
uh, ethical and legal issues involving artificial intelligence. So various systems which use these AI technologies are becoming autonomous in terms of complexity of the tasks which they perform and their poten potential impact on the world. But there is diminishing ability of humans to understand, predict and control their functioning. And there are numerous options in terms of regulation technologies that use AI, which can be regulated and subject to copyright. But what are the issues which uh, uh, of uh, conducting clinical research in our country, which is a developing country? So most of the time, issues like approval delays, deficiency of functioning of CROs and other stakeholders, liabilities, compensation to injured subjects, insurance, all these remain prevalent in India. So always there's a need for law to ensure that subjects involved in research are not at all exploited and they should be well informed about risk and should be provided clarity on regulations. So just to conclude my talk, as clinical research becomes increasingly globalized, there is always a need to make research culturally and methodologically valid. And this kind of gap which exists between developed and developing countries should be narrowed in order to ensure global justice. And emphasis should uh, is to ensure that research be made an integral part of all the biomedical research. So I, I uh, would like to just discuss a small case scenario. Now, supposing you are covering the emergency department when a 33-year-old motorcycle rider is brought in with a tibia or fibula fracture. Now, you carefully explain the severity of injury to the patient and recommend an immediate IND and intramedullary uh, nailing. Now, the patient states that he trusts you and knows that he should have the operation, but despite his confidence in you, he declines the operative intervention. He explains to you that his one of his best friends died in the operating room after a motorcycle accident and he's afraid that he will also die in the operating room. So he requests that you think of a different way to care for him uh, that doesn't require being in an operating room. So now two main uh, problems here. What are the ethical principles involved and do you have any legal concerns? So... You know, the ethical principles are individuals with uh, decision-making capacity are allowed to make unwise or seemingly foolish decisions, but beneficence demands that you help the patient. And of course, non-maleficence requires that you should not be harming the patient. But what are the legal responsibilities since you are on call to the emergency department, you are required to take care of this patient. And also you have to ensure that the patient also has decision-making capacity. Now, once you have explained everything to the patient, patient again explains his fears and he rec you recommend an evaluation by a psychiatrist. So again, the patient thanks you and then uh, he refuses. So you sit down with the patient and discuss his injury, dangers of not having the surgery and urgency to prevent any kind of further infection. So you ask about his friend and it is evident that his friend had sustained some life-threatening injuries and he had died as a result of those injuries and not as part of the operating uh, procedure. So now you explain all this to the patient and try to persuade him to agree to the surgery. So what are the different strategies to assist this patient? You can sit down and spend time to assist the patient in his understanding. Persuasion is appropriate. Secondly, you can, all, sorry, you can always suggest a second orthopedic opinion and also suggest to include family and friends in the discussion. So what are the some of the recommendations? You can develop appropriate communication skills to assist all the patients. Seek assistance from your colleagues when patients are declining appropriate management and consider a consultation with your institution's ethics consultation service. So these are my references and uh, that is uh, the end of my talk. Thank you all for your patient hearing. Thank you so much, ma'am. Yes. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Dr. Sapna. Uh, thank so you. very nice presentation and uh, thanks from my side also. Thank yeah. you. Chinmay, please take it. So moving towards our next speaker, Dr. Paisali Despande. She's uh, an independent consultant in clinical research. 
she has done her uh, master's degree in anthropology from Savitri Pulli University. She has accomplished her uh, postgraduate diploma from Delhi. She has uh, over 26 years of experience in the field of clinical research. She has been working on a couple of ethics committees in Pune, Maharashtra, and uh, Ruby Hall, Sancheti Hospital, and uh, Joshi Hospital in Pune. She is running various online courses on clinical research with uh, Techno Bridge. She has designed a syllabus for clinical research and data management for SPPU as a elective paper for MSc Biotechnology. And uh, she is into training for uh, ethics committee since years and doing training for more than 65 ethics committees. With these words, I would like to invite Dr. Vaishal uh, Deshpande to deliver her talk. Yes, ma'am, you can continue. Uh, thank you so much. I'll share my PPT. You can switch on your camera, ma'am. Yes. Slides. Yes, the visible full screen. Come in. I have made it full screen now. Yes, yes. Ma'am, okay. um, you can unmute, ma'am. Is it audible now? Yes. Yes, okay. Uh, shall we? Mm. Okay. So, uh, Dr. Sapna has beautifully conducted the session about composition and uh, what are the basic responsibilities and what the history behind it. So, um, I think we are having our session since four o'clock so i'll take some liberty to tell a story that so that everybody will be back to our sessions so this story will tell you about the ethics what exactly ethics is so uh, we all are aware of chanakya so chanakya was kind of friend philosopher guide of chandragupta maurya and uh, one day uh, the another ambassador from another country visited uh, Chandragupta Mauryas and stated that your country is so beautifully, uh, you're ruling the uh, your state, country. Uh, everybody is so happy with your whatever regulations you are having. If you are asking for one rupee tax, people are happy to give you two rupees. So how this is possible? So uh, Chandragupta Maurya said, rather than me, uh, why don't you visit Chanakya so that he can explain you whatever I am right now doing. So ambassador went and visited Ch Chanakya. Uh, they started discussion and soon they became very good friends. The simple and why they became good friends because their intentions were matching. And uh, then the discussion went on and uh, last day Chanakya said now you please visit to my place so Whatever remaining is there, we will discuss at my place and then we will proceed for dinner. So the ambassador was really very happy because he was invited as a guest. He was invited as a guest and they both uh, went to Chanakya's so-called study room where the ambassador found there is a pair of oil lamp. One was leated and the other was unleated. The ambassador couldn't understand why there is a requirement of two oil lamps when one was deleted, but he didn't ask anything. Soon the discussion went on and as soon as the Chan uh, Chanakya said, now the discussion is over, we will proceed for dinner. As soon as he said the sentence, a servant walked in and he, what he did, he leated the unleated lamp and unleated the leated lamp. Now the ambassador couldn't stop asking him that why you are doing so when one lamp is already going on, why there is a need of another leading up a lamp? Chanakya gave him a very beautiful answer. He said, till the time I was doing an official discussion with you, 
I was using the oil which was given to me by my king. And now you are guest at my place. So I cannot use the oil which is given to me by my king, but I have to use the oil which is purchased by me. As soon as he said that now with this sentence, we can definitely understand what the ethics means. <clears throat> and now this ethics we are going to implement into our clinical research. So as we all are aware that it has, ethios is a Greek word which has come from the custom, Greek word meaning custom or character. It is basically a systematic study of values towards understanding and examining what is right and what is wrong. So I won't go into much detail about what we are going to do now. Uh, as Sapna has rightly mentioned, I'll just brief what is the requirement of composition. Now, as per NDCTR rules, now this requirement is there for clinical trial, BAB studies, or even the academic research. That is the EC which will get registered under DHR. Composition, the ethics committee shall have minimum of seven members. I will also tell who is required to be affiliated and who is not required to be affiliated. So chairperson, 100% not affiliated to the institute. Clinician, they may be or they may not be affiliated. Lay person, as per ICMR guidelines, should not be affiliated to the institute. Then basic medical scientist or one woman person or one legal person, one social scientist, they may, may not be affiliated to the institute. And coming to the member secretary, yes, member secretary has to be 100% affiliated to the institute. So what is the basic responsibility of the ethics committee? So they are going to ensure the independent, competent, and timely review of the ethical aspect of all the project proposal which are received in order to safeguard. Safeguard what? Safeguard dignity, rights, safety, and well-being of actual as well as the potential research subject. Now they also need to under appropriate training to enhance the competence and to maintain confidentiality of document and discussion during the review process. They have to allot time for reviewing the proposal. And that is the reason if we have seen the ICMR guideline, the ICMR guideline states that at least three weeks prior, the document should reach the EC office. Then there is a need to put on the record various instead. It may be a financial or otherwise to avoid the conflict of interest. Non-judgmental and unbiased. So these are the basic responsibilities of entire as a group of ethics committee. Now, one by one, we will see the uh, responsibilities of all the ethics committee members. First, we will see about the member secretary. So, going to plan the meeting calendar, coordinating, coordination of the meetings, which will include the circulating of agendas, documents, reminders to the ethics committee member, maintaining the attendance, and maintaining the minutes of the meeting. Also ensure the timely submission of the documents. Then once the meeting is over, then circulating minutes of the meeting, communication with investigator regarding whatever decision is. Also for the administrative purpose, acknowledging various documents which are related to the ongoing trials, such as amendments, SAE notifications, safety reports, protocol deviations, annual reports, CTRI letter or number and communication with the DCGIs regarding various kind of queries. We all are aware that DCGI always bombard with lot many queries. Now record of EC related document. Now we are aware that EC related document needs to be maintained for five years as per NDCTR rules. Now what needs to be archived? the constitution and composition of the EC, then CV of all the EC members, SOPs of the ECs, then national and international guidelines, copies of all EC submission documents and all the corresponding EC members, investigator and regulatory authorities, which may include the agenda of the EC meeting, minutes of the meeting, 
copies of the decision and communicate it to all the participants. Record of all the notification to the IC by principal investigator. And of course, the training details of all the ethics committee members. Now we will come to a very important and second uh, ethics committee member who is a lawyer. Lawyer is going to review the CTA as well as ICF. The we must understand the ICF is that is informed consent form is such a document which is going to be reviewed by everybody. Their perspectives are going to change. The review of the CTA will include parties which are included, then details about the protocol like number, title, date, version, and who is the PI. Then statement of work, which will include the scope of agreement, terms, responsibilities of the parties, then payment details, which will include page name, address, PAN number, etc. Also about the confidentiality, then indemnification, insurance, dispute resolution, then arbitration, termination if at all the trial is getting terminated, then budget for the trial, then record retention and about the site audits. Whenever it comes to the biomedical research, the lawyer is also going to look into the intellectual property like intervention and improvements, ownership of the data and publication rights. Then what the lawyer is going to review is reviewing the ICF, the nature and purpose of the studies as it is research. Duration of the participation with number of participants. Procedures or investigations be performed on the participant. Foreseeable risk and discomforts. Benefit to the participants, community or medical profession at whatever may be applicable. Then what is the policy on compensation? Availability of the medical treatment for such injuries or risk management. Alternative treatments if it is available and steps taken for ensuring the confidentiality. Then also he is going to see into the that participants has no loss of benefit on withdrawing from the trial. Benefit sharing in the event of commercialization of the product. Contact details of the PI or co-PI in multicentric studies for asking more information related to the research or in case of any injury. The same time, contact details of the chairperson of IC for appeal against the violation or more information related to the research or in case of injuries as well as protection and rights of the subject. Now we will come to the clinicians. The clinicians are going to look into the protocol and inform consent form. So clinicians are going to review protocol for the following aspect. Clear research objective and rational for undertaking the investigation and human participant in the light of existing knowledge. Then participants recruitment procedure means how the participants are going to be enrolled onto the trial. Inclusion and exclusion criteria for the entry of the participant. Then statistical methodology, including the sample size, that is potential for reaching sound conclusion with the smallest number of the participants. Then appropriateness of a type of study design. The study design may be observational, experimental, pilot, randomization, or blinding, etc. in relation to the objective of the study. Intended intervention, that is dose of the drug, route of administration, duration of treatment, and details of invasive procedure, if there are any. Of course, plan for the withdrawal or withhold for the standard therapies in the course of research. Then procedures for seeking and obtaining informed consent with the sample of patient information sheet 
and informed consent form in the English as well as in the local languages. Now we will come to the basic scientists. The basic scientists are going to review the investigator brochure and ICFN protocol. So we have seen the details about what needs to be seen with the ICFN protocol. Now, when it comes to the investigator brochure, the scientist, because we all are aware that investigator brochure is nothing but compilation of clinical and non-clinical data. So that is going to be reviewed by the basic scientist. Then we will come to the social scientist where they are going to review the informed consent form and protocol. They are going to review the design of trial. If at all there are any blood samples withdrawal, number of blood samples, how many uh, samples are required and post-trial access. This is very important from the social scientist point of view. Then we will come to the chairperson. Chairperson is the leader of the team. Chairperson is going to ensure adequacy of the infrastructure and facility qualification of the study team. Conflict of interest of ethics committee member as well as the study team members. Plan to maintain the confidentiality of the participants. More cautiously about the vulnerable population. Then about the essay compensation, then ongoing monitoring by frequently visiting patients and seeing the AV recordings wherever applicable, ensuring the training of the ethics committee member. Then we'll come to the person. I always feel that layperson is a very important person into ethics committee because layperson can think something out of box. So let's to ensure the ethical review of the proposal. I save along with the translation because we always feel if the layperson understand the translation, the patients also or the participants also will understand it nicely. Layperson is going to evaluate the benefit and risk from the participants' perspective and opine whether benefits justify the risk. Then they are going to serve as patient, participant, or community representative and bring in the ethical and societal concern, if any. So that's all from my side. Uh, if there is anything, we can discuss. Oh, thank you, madam. Uh, it is an excellent presentation. Uh, there are a few questions which, uh, you know, people raised, uh, uh, especially uh, in the participants group. Uh, okay. They all uh, appreciate your uh, uh, efforts. Uh, basically, what we can say is that, you know, like uh, biological sign, uh, a life, uh, what they're asking is whether the lay person can huh? be uh, what is what should be their qualification? Maybe you can explain. Yes, lay person can be from the non-scientific background. Uh, that is, uh, maybe even a CA can become a very good lay person from the commerce background or arts background. Even they are uh, engineer people, they also can become a lay person. So uh, basically non-scientific person who doesn't have any knowledge about the medical side they can become the layperson. Okay. Thank you, Vana. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Thank for you for excellent presentation. Thank you. And thank you for giving me the opportunity to present. Thank you, Shri sir. Thank you so much, ma'am. So now moving towards our last speaker of today, um, Mrs. Uh, Renuka Nyogi. She is currently working as Deputy General Manager and Head Global Clinical Quality Management at Sun Pharma. And uh, she is the ICR West Chapter Chairperson. So she is having around uh, 16 years of experience. And she is a registered quality assurance professional in GCP, RQIP, and GCP from Society of Quality Assurance. I started here in, in uh, Sanofi, a 
clinical research associate and they served at various positions with increasing responsibilities. Her last assignment in Sanofi was that the that of project management function for India and Southeast Asia cluster. She joined uh, Sun Pharma in May 23 as Deputy General Manager and Head Global Clinical Quality Management. She is currently active member of uh, Indian Society for uh, Clinical Research since last eight years and is currently the chair for ISCR West chapter since 2021. She has been conducted several training programs and workshops. She is the co-author uh, task force member for the DCT position paper, decentralized clinical trials, a landscape assessment with recommendations from for growing the ecosystem by ICSR, ISCR 2022. She has received awards such as uh, ISCR President Award 2019 and ISCR Hall of Fame Award 2018 and again in 2020. So with these words, I would like to invite Dr. Uh, Mrs. Uh, Renuka Nyogi to deliver a talk. Thank you. Uh, talk, thank you, Dr. Chinmaya, uh, for this kind introduction. Uh, let me just uh, share my screen first. And uh, if you can uh, confirm that you are able to see my slides, uh, then it would be great. Uh, yes, we can okay. see. Okay, great. Uh, so uh, thank you, Dr. Chinmaya, for this introduction. And uh, a big, big thank you, Dr. Shivamurti, for providing me this opportunity to be a speaker uh, for this particular clinical trial summit and as well as encouraging me to write the chapter. I think uh, I, I started off my writing, I can say, from <laughs> because of you. So uh, I, will, I will always be very, very grateful for this opportunity. So my last topic, and it's kind of got an added pressure because it's almost eight o'clock and there are more than 200 participants are still active uh, in this meeting link. So uh, hats off to each one of you for being so patient and uh, such an encouraging audience. So I will quickly go ahead uh, with my topic. So it, it, it kind of really speaks about the clinical trial challenges and concerns that a patient feels when he or she is participating in a trial. So I'll, I'll just skip this slide. I think we all know what are the benefits of clinical research just in the interest of time. So patient, I think patient is the most important stakeholder. We need to understand that patient needs to be well informed and our behavior needs to be very well with them. They need to be treated well because once they feel good, then they will continue to stay with us in any clinical trial. So how we behave and how we really impart knowledge uh, to, to the trial patient has a direct impact on recruitment and retention. There's a lot of technological advances that have happened and that technological uh, advances have seeped in into clinical research as well. There are a lot of benefits, but we need to be cognizant of the patient challenges and concerns. So let's look at some challenges. So as for the latest census, which was done in 2011, the literacy rate of India is 74.04%, which means that we still have a very significant uh, percentage of population which is illiterate. So, you know, if we just start thinking an informed consent document when given to a patient 20, 30 pages, Obviously, then there is an impartial witness coming into the picture. So things become a little tough. So one piece is informed consent, but we also have the patient diaries. You know, sometimes they're paper based, sometimes they are uh, electronic based. So, you know, reading, writing sometimes comes uh, as part and parcel of the clinical trial journey. But, you know, illiteracy is definitely a big, big issue. Level of comprehension, you know, uh, I, I, I remember, you know, I was working, I started off my career in clinical research and in a few years uh, from then, my, my mother had to be operated for nasal polyps, very minor surgery, I would say, <clears throat> and I was a CRA, so absolutely knowing in depth the clinical research principles and everything. But when the doctor, uh, you know, explained to me that, okay, we need to go for surgery on the day of surgery, we went and they gave me an informed consent form. But obviously me being a daughter of my mother was obviously full panic and I just signed it without reading it. 
yeah i mean it's it's uh, you all may little bit laugh at this but this is the situation with everybody with each one of us because it's our near and dear ones who are undergoing a surgery or who are needing a treatment at this point of time so i personally feel you know this level of comprehension i mean how much are we reading the document how much are we really understanding or whether the doctor is even explaining and how much are we comprehending the information is always always a big challenge because the situation at that point is very different then the patient is always unsure of the treatment option i mean if it is a single open arm study then the situation is very different but imagine a situation where you have a randomized double blind study whether it is a standard of care or placebo the patient at that point of screening is always unsure of which treatment he would receive right he or she would receive then obviously there is a lot of anxiety about safety and efficacy of trial treatment right i mean though there is uh the phase 2 data like say for example it's a phase 3 when there are phase 1 phase 2 data already established and properly written in the informed consent document the doctor showing all the confidence and you know uh doing a detailed counseling session with the patient but the patient still feels a lot anxious about safety and efficacy and you know i mean uh, i know hindi is not really allowed to speak in the conference but i really want to say because the talk topic is from a patient perspective it is very common that the patient will feel ki mere baad kya hoga what will happen to my family right if something happens to me so he, the patient is absolutely very very anxious the patient is worried about the worsening of disease you know Uh, what happens like today i am at uh, 20% but what if it increases to 30% 40% there is lot of you know uncertainty inside the patient then you know we know all the clinical trials of course now the situations have changed and there's a lot of um, simplification that is coming in but still we can't deny the fact that there are numerous patient visits uh that are in any clinical trial be it screening visit then a randomization visit and then visit 3 visit 4 sometimes in between you have telephonic visits but the on site patient visits then consider if it is a pediatric study the child will have to miss a school the or the child will be missing out on extracurricular activities you know so all these things we need to kind of really be very very Judge, you know very very carefully thought of when we design any protocol several blood draws i mean i remember you know uh, uh, too many blood draws I, I, i'll tell you one situation i was a little shocked when i was uh, in my previous company as you know quality role i went and i i really understood when i was reviewing the source documents you know twice or thrice i saw that the study coordinator had taken the blood sample like today she had taken then after in the next week again she had taken and again she had taken and the reason every time she was writing uh, was that the blood samples were hemolyzed so can you imagine how difficult you know we are making things for the patient every time we are calling them because the sample was hemolyzed so maybe something that we need to reflect i mean firstly you know like maybe once in 3 months or once in 6 months the blood procedures would be there and again because of incompetency at the site level you are calling the patient several times to have those uh, complex but uh, blood draws trial procedures i think increasingly as companies are moving into specialty care business we do see a lot of complex trial procedures coming you know it's no longer simple just blood withdrawal lab test uh do your weight bp and that's it no no it is just not like that there are many many different procedure per the protocol that are being introduced and we are just the patient feels so overwhelmed i mean i i i do sometimes see senior citizens around us and you give them a very complex new iphone to them they will be very overwhelmed to how to use it so imagine how the patient would be feeling when he is asked to complete a e pro or a e patient diary on a mobile app right drug storage at home another another area which i feel is always something that keeps me wondering that how patients are managing you have a temperature requirement for example the trial has a temperature requirement of 2 to 8 degrees seriously are we just just think about your uh, you know the the towns or villages and there are there are uh, uh, patients who come from villages 
are they really having a refrigerator at their home if they are having do they have like a 24 by 7 electricity coming at their home how is the temperature being monitored is the drug being stored correctly at the appropriate temperature requirement per the protocol right daily routine like we discuss even for working uh, patients you know taking leave every time just because you have to do several blood draws or complex procedures etc becomes very very challenging for them to take half day leave or a full day leave and come down to the hospital another very very uh, you know not so talked about topic i mean most of these things i think we all know but one thing one topic is always not much spoken about is the contraception and every clinical trial in every informed consent we will always have a paragraph of contraception now if it is a married couple or a married uh, man or a woman then if the doctor is discussing this topic it is still okay but imagine an unmarried girl going to a doctor's cabin along with her parents and the doctor discussing the informed consent form and speaking about contraception how embarrassed that girl would be and the parents would be right i mean these are it's required so i am not saying at all over here what is right or wrong i think this information definitely needs to be given but all what uh, the purpose of my topic is really to bring forth the thoughts that run in the patient's mind right so that's the whole purpose uh, you know why i have highlighted these certain points shyness to face the camera not everybody is very comfortable in facing the camera and if you have an av consenting requirement all the more people will become very conscious they may agree they may not agree that may also happen then fear of spoiling patient doctor relationship i think this is this is a very very common issue because in india you know we we really have a very strong patient doctor relationship and we always feel that okay you know this doctor is there for me and uh, i am participating because he has shown confidence but maybe several visits down the line if the patient starts to feel that i want to withdraw you know he is already disengaged the patient is already disengaged but just the fear of what will doctor say makes him continue to be in the trial and results into lot of non compliances completion of e diaries i just spoke about the mobile uh, you can relate to it management of screen failure patients nobody really speaks about them so imagine a patient who who you know is so wanting there is no other treatment therapy available and the patient and his family is having complete hope only from the clinical trial and the patient screen fails maybe because of some laboratory parameter or any other thing so how do we really manage these patients think about this psychology of the patient the emotional impact the patient and the family was so high very hopeful on the treatment that they may receive from a trial but all of a sudden then the side staff will come and say that unfortunately your screen failed and you will not be able to participate right so uh, emotional thing is it just hits very hard so oh, ale and of course then there are many many uh, social religious cultural and economical barriers in our country our and and that is of course there in many other countries and almost all countries i would say but of course for us i mean i can take you uh, as simple example as uh, you know how to manage i mean this always we used to discuss of course now there are very set protocols but during the Ram ramadan period you know uh, especially in a diabetic anti diabetic trial how do we really manage these patients how do we manage their food cycles their ip or investigational product administration etc and likewise you know i mean i i remember one of the doctor was uh discussing with me when the av consenting came in uh so the the family uh, you know the the lady had to wear the pallu the ghungat every time so even when whenever she used to step out of the house so even in front of the doctor she always had her pallu down now imagine in a av consenting when we want the identification of the patient and the doctor and the lady is just not ready to take off her pallu because it's against her culture 
right so these are these are different different barriers we sometimes think we sometimes may not think because it may not just come directly to us but these are pointers for us to really think through as to how we can build solutions around these challenges and concerns that the patients feel then of course we have media publicity and the general perception about clinical trials in in lay public and confidentiality issues i mean this is again very very uh, common problem you know we we don't want to tell things sometimes families or sometimes patient as well may not be very very uh, comfortable to speak about being participated in a trial and i'll tell you my own uh, family uh, example so my mother's aunt at that point of time she um, was participating in a parkinson trial and she knew where i was working she knew that i was into clinical research her entire family knew about it but they never ever told me all these things right i mean would i have been of any help to them so later on when you know uh, unfortunately she passed away because of other issues but at after that they told me that she was also part of the clinical trial so you know that just kind of really made me reflect you know why why people are just not talking about clinical research why patients are not going forward and talking to their family and relatives that this is the therapy that they are exploring so like i said these were certain challenges but we also as an industry all of us are part of the clinical research industry whether we belong to a sponsor or a cro or ethics committee or investigator side staff we need to find certain solutions right and how do we find these solutions we have to identify what are the influencers and what are the motivators so first absolutely what i feel is the good doctor patient relationship every person at the site staff need to have need to develop the soft skills the emotional quotient and our behavior the patient need to be dealt with care patience empathy respect and calmness pathways need to be created for open transparent and honest dialogues make the patients walk the clinical trial journey when i say walk the clinical trial journey when the patient comes for the screening visit at that point of time literally take the patient make him or her understand that okay this is the time when you you know when you first enter the hospital this is the registration area this is where you will have to fill the form then go on the first floor this is where you will meet the doctor the clinical research room where you will have to spend like an hour for your lab procedures this 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 is all taken so what this you know this entire visual the patient when you explain these things when you actually make the patients walk the journey the patients will be able to visualize and be better prepared they will know what to expect when their trial participation starts protocol preparation with a lot of patient centric approach and i know for sure that a lot of companies especially the mnc's at this point of time are taking patient feedbacks right at the time of protocol development and of course implement components of decentralized clinical trials you know where you can reduce on site patient visits by introducing telemedicine or frequent virtual calls or introduce home nursing options where the nurse home nurse can go to the uh, patient's residence and then either administer the drug then take the vital signs check the uh, diary and etc so you know these things can really be worked out collaborate with diagnostics labs at multiple locations for example we have a if if the patient has to do an mri the patient need not really come to the trial site every time right i mean he can go around to a nearest a lab a certified accredited lab near to the residence and then send the report so and use of variables where you have the easy transmission of data other things which i which i also feel could be introduced is like greet patients on their birthdays and anniversaries you know the patients will really feel so good when they when they see that personal involvement in them appreciate their participation in trials and certain reminders before patient visits you know every time i remember when i was a monitor the the site used to write patient miss the uh, protocol visit patient miss the protocol visit so my question is what is the site doing right you can't expect a patient to remember uh, for your two year old study 
that he or she has to come every month or this is the date or this is the window period right so give them certain reminders whether message whatsapp call whatever works provide them lab report copies and i have seen them i have seen some of the patients in some of the sites doing these things you know of course we need to take certain approvals in place but there's no harm patient really likes when they see their own lab reports issue reimbursement in an expedited manner whether it is about their travel or meals etc take extra care of the vulnerable population another mm. good idea would be as as we are growing as an industry it is important and it is i personally feel it will be a good idea that we make patient the the experienced trial patients as ambassadors of clinical trials so you know in a hospital we can call them uh, and let them share their own experience of participating in clinical trials or you know provide them opportunities of counseling or experience sharing with other patients uh invite patients as lay person in ethics committees uh, dr vaishali just before this session she she beautifully um, uh, expressed who can be a lay person and i feel that if patient themselves become a lay person in an ethics committee it would add a different layer to how the ethics committees are reviewing the protocols or also to support different patient advocacy groups and it's very important that you you provide okay. a regular health status updates to the patient if you can concise your talk ma'am yes yes so very quickly i'm so sorry i'm so sorry i'll just quickly finish so uh, there are certain patient responsibilities and rights so before the participation you know the trial uh, the patient needs to provide to the best of the knowledge the entire history and the current medical information they should read the informed consent form in detail and discuss uh, different options and ask questions i think very important for the patients to speak and ask questions till their doubts are well answered and uh, also to discuss with their family and family doctor and only sign the informed consent when they agree they during the trial the patient has to follow all the trial procedure take the medicines carry the trial supplies use unused to their visits not to give any other medicines to any other people complete the patient diary so basically in short you know be compliant to the trial procedure because that will not only help them but also help the research and also be aware that they have right to withdraw from the trial after the trial the patient should not give like i said a new trial medicines to the patients return all the unused supplies and submit any bills and inform about the health condition so this is just what i have taken uh, from uh, from uh, the kokila benambani hospital and a little bit added mine as well but i think very important for us to make the patients aware of their rights and i strongly encourage for all the sites to do that the patients need to be aware that they have the right to accessibility availability and continuity of care right to dignity and privacy of the patient right to ensure safety right to confidentiality to refusal of treatment right to information education right to get protection from neglect right very important very important point which is never many a times discussed right to give or refuse any informed consent right to complain the patient is not happy he or she needs to speak up right to know the expected cost or the expenses that would come right to access his or her own clinical records right to have a second opinion it's not that the doctor has said and immediately the patient agrees to be part of the trial no a right to transfer and continuity of care you know sometimes relocations happen so they they are allowed to do that and right to know the hospital rules and regulations and express any special preference spiritual or cultural need so on that note i i would like to end my uh, talk and sorry if i got extended but thank you so much dr shiva murthy sir for for giving me this opportunity and these are my contact details so if anybody has any queries uh, feel free to reach out to me thank you so much i would like to say this is one of my you know favorite subject uh expelli you know pair i think uh, i have not seen many conferences uh, holding this topic especially uh, and uh, i especially you know wanted someone to speak and i feel that you know very happy that you know i have chosen the right person to speak on this and thank i you. think you gave the complete justice for this and thank you so much for making it happen and also you know on my request uh, writing the article
thank so you. i hope you will uh, you know enjoy writing more and uh, i feel someday you will publish your own book also <laughs> thank you so much sir welcome yeah uh, so chinmay yes sir so chinmay yeah. so will uh, sir i will hand over the mic to you and you can conclude this for tomorrow today sir uh, okay <laughs> Uh, so today i would like to say that you know like uh, uh, initially sorry i would like to say start with my sorry for initial you know issues related to you know uh, uh, participants window uh, today i would like to declare that you know tomorrow also we will have everyone on the speakers window only uh, so that you know we will be able to cater to each and everyone easily and uh, see their problems and ensure that everything goes fine and uh, tomorrow also i request everyone to come here only and uh, be participate to completely participate in the event and uh, excellent participation by, by everyone and at the same time excellent uh, presentations by everyone and as a president of mps and as a as organizing secretary i owe a lot of thanks to all of you i i know like uh, all of you have filled my heart that's what i can say and especially chinmay excellent job and i would like to you know thank two two persons dr shiva sankara parasa and uh, mr ravi teja you know uh, these two are the people you know who are behind the screen who helped me to bring all the participants here on the you know on this platform by you know day and night they have worked in the uh, working on the whatsapp group and adding everyone and i am sure it is such a it was such a difficult job and thank you so much for all the participants for active participation lot of questions lot of you uh, know information shared and lot of good topics and i i thank uh, dr basu sir uh, who really did excellent job you know most of the i have seen many regulators coming online giving the keynote speech and uh, overview for few minutes but sir took excellent presentation covering all the chapters of uh, ndct and i think you know like uh, we uh, really thank him for that purpose, for that and the uh, uh, sir uh, and also i should thank dr koner sir mr koner sir snehendu koner sir from clinima uh, clinimed and uh, you know um, manish uh, manish singh yadav sir from uh, ethics in uh, uh, crs for uh, sponsoring at the same time snehendu sir for uh, you know uh, doing the honors on behalf of dcgi uh, so he conveyed the messages he was been uh, liaising with the dcgi and he conveyed our request and he again brought out uh, something you know with the permission with his uh, their permission he read out that message and that really added a lot of value and uh, i believe that everyone is encouraged to do more uh, work in the clinical research sector and right from uh, you know like uh, shambho sir uh, really excellent job on regulators and then vaishali madam on ethics committee uh, sapna madam on ethics committee then renuka on patients perspective really nice and uh, coming back to other speakers uh, whom did i miss i i think myself and yourself we did on uh, evolution gcp Uh, and uh, your uh, presentation was very nice uh, having all the pictures and uh, nice steps that was really appreciable and uh, uh, well sir uh, like uh, gayatri madam did excellent job on statistics anirudh sir really did excellent job on uh, regulatory concepts uh, so anyone i missed basu sir is over i think i have, I have covered everyone uh thank you so much for our active participation by all the pa participants tomorrow we would like to see in the great strength and uh, once again apologize for, for the you know initial uh, issues but i hope we have we overcome uh, we uh, took the you know uh, we, with our strong will we uh, we could come out of this issue and then manage the whole show and thank you uh, dr chinmay for excellent job i think tomorrow also you uh, we need your support because sanjeev i, I, I think you know that uh, so we yeah. will support him to ensure that you know tomorrow also goes uh, smoothly no, no, uh, hopefully, and, hopefully, yeah. sir, hopefully i will be able to do tomorrow hopefully yeah, yeah. oh that's good that's good yeah 
uh, thank you so, so much so we are looking forward for you tomorrow and any any participant would like to say any words maybe they can unmute themselves and uh, you know maybe one or two uh, you know uh, attendees they can express and uh, we can close the session for today and then we'll come back tomorrow any participants yeah okay dr shivamurthy i am dr ravi shankar from adi chinsung institute of medical sciences yes sir I you are my senior thank you so much I congratulate the team for an uh, excellent uh, job in organizing. I know the difficulties which you have faced. You have expressed yourself. It is absolutely wonderful. I think this will be a, it's just a beginning. There will be so many other uh, uh, programs coming ahead. I think this will foster the culture of uh, research amongst our community. It's a great Thank effort you. from you and your team. Congratulations, sir. Thank you so much, sir, for your active participation. Uh, any one more? One more? Anyone? Anyone else? Can we have someone? Oh, uh, Basona sir, thank you so much for here uh, being here. And can you please, uh, you know, maybe want to comment? Thank you. That was a wonderful session for all the days, uh, uh, whole sessions. So uh, once again, congratulate to Shumurti in uh, bringing in all everyone into the platform, this platform. Please uh, go ahead. We look forward tomorrow. Thank you. So, thank you so much. I would like to thank you again for, you know, you are the chairman of the whole organizing committee. Hope we are able to justify the, you know, the whole efforts. <laughs> thank you. Okay. Thank you. thank you, everyone. See you tomorrow. We are already, uh, you know, late. We expected actually uh, up to 8.20 uh, for today. I think we are on time. Well done. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very thank much. Thank you, dear doctors. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much for this uh, uh, wonderful. Thank session. you so much, ClearNet. Yeah, the uh, last yes, but not sir. the least. Oh, Again, you know, ClearNet. Um, um, uh, oh, uh, you are a good name, uh, Ritu Parna. Yeah, yes, Ritu Parna and Navamita. Both of you are excellent, you know, excellent yeah. support. Thank you so much for all the efforts. Thank you, sir. And uh, yes, you know, we will continue the way we did today also. Okay? Sure, sir. Hopefully, we will be having a same similar session tomorrow also. Looking forward yeah. to it. Thank you for... Uh, Please uh, record, I know. Uh, uh, yes, uh, keep the recorded uh, version sure, and uh, everyone sure, is sir. asking for it. Yes, yeah, sir. Thank we you. have recorded and we'll get back to you shortly, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you everyone. Good night and stay safe Good and healthy. Good night. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Thank you. So we are signing off for today. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Yeah.